I hated Thursdays. Not because it was the start of the weekend rush, but because of Jerry, the creepy customer who walked in like clockwork every Thursday at 3 p.m. sharp. I'd been working at this restaurant for about six months, and his routine was as predictable as the stale nacho cheese we served. He always ordered the same thing, a Crunchwrap Supreme, a side of cinnamon twists, and a large Mountain Dew. The moment he stepped through the door, my stomach dropped. I couldn't explain it. There was just something unsettling about him. He wore a faded baseball cap pulled low over his forehead, and his eyes were always glued to me. I'd catch him smiling, more like leering, really, while he placed his order. Hey there, beautiful. What's a girl like you doing in a place like this? I'd just roll my eyes, trying to smile politely. Just serving tacos, sir. Just like the last time. He drolled over me for some time before moving to the restroom. My co-workers, Jess and Mark, would stand behind me, stifling their laughter. Maybe he takes a big dump every Thursday. Jess joked one day, nudging Mark. They both chuckled, but I could only manage a weak smile. You should ask him how his bowels are doing. Very funny. I muttered, glaring at them. But as annoying as they were, I felt a little comfort in knowing they were there. Over the next weeks, I started noticing a strange pattern during his visits. He would come in every Thursday afternoon, place the same order to go while checking me out, and then using the restroom for a couple of minutes before grabbing his order and leaving. One Thursday, after he left the restroom, the bathroom light would flicker momentarily. At first, I brushed it off as faulty wiring. Taco Bell wasn't exactly known for its maintenance, but as the flickering continued, I felt my curiosity grow. One Thursday, the light flickered longer than usual. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. When the shift ended, I mentioned it to Mark. Hey, can you check the bathroom light? It's been acting weird. He waved me off. Just a loose bulb. I'll look at it later. But it bugged me. The next day, I asked our maintenance guy, Dave, to take a peek. He grumbled, but reluctantly agreed. Yeah, probably just a wiring issue, Ella, he said, scratching his head while inspecting the light fixture. But I'll check it out for you. After a few minutes of poking around, he said, You're right about one thing. This Taco Bell has some odd features. Look at this air vent. He pointed up to a vent close to the ceiling, nearly hidden from view. It was unusual for a place like this, but I didn't think much of it. Is it broken? I asked, squinting. Nope, just strange. Not sure why it's here. Could be some leftover from the old hotel they built over. I shrugged, not giving it much thought until later that night. My curiosity peaked. I decided to check it out after closing hours. I climbed up on a chair, unscrewed the vent cover, and peered inside. That's when I saw it, a tiny red blinking light. At first, I thought it was part of the ventilation system, but something about its positioning struck me as odd. My heart raced. I pulled out my phone and snapped a picture, then decided to climb back down. I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to know what it was. That night, after I got home, I replayed the day's events in my mind. Why did I feel like I was being watched? The following Thursday, I approached the vent again, my heart pounding. I unscrewed it and looked inside, but the light was gone. Confused, I checked the camera feed in the kitchen. Just then, the familiar voice broke my concentration. Hey there, gorgeous. The creep said, stepping up to the counter. I forced a smile. Hi. What can I get you today? As he placed his order, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. As he left for the bathroom, I was overwhelmingly compelled to follow him. I glanced at the bathroom door, and for the first time, I felt a strange urge to see what he was doing in there. After he left, while Eve teasing me and making some comments about my body, I couldn't ignore the growing sense of unease. I decided to grab a ladder and check the vent again. I climbed up and unscrewed it, but I didn't find just the light. I found a hidden camera aimed toward the toilet. 
Horror washed over me. It had an SSD card attached, which I pulled out. I informed Jess, who brought her laptop. What I saw made my blood run cold. There were many people, including us, who were captured, various parts of us visible. He had meticulously recorded his victims. I felt sick to my stomach. I immediately called the police, my voice trembling as I reported the situation. They reached out and together we made a plan. When he arrived the following Thursday, I could barely keep it together. He followed his ritual and then I watched from behind the counter as the police rushed in as soon as he emerged from the washroom. He was arrested. They searched his apartment, heart pounding until I got the call. He had over eight weeks worth of private videos of various customers. I felt sick as I realized how an unassuming creep of a customer could pull something like this. I just couldn't continue with the job and left soon. Halloween night at Greenwood always seemed to bring out the best in our neighborhood. Kids running around in costumes, houses decked out in spooky decorations. It was my favorite time of the year. This year, though, Jack Marlowe and his wife Lisa really outdid the rest of us with their haunted house. They were hosting a small get-together, so I was an hour or so early to help out and enjoy the night. Rick Thompson is my name. I'd been good friends and business partners with Jack for all these years, and Lisa was his girlfriend. We shared much, but things had started getting a bit tense between him and Lisa lately. I knew about Lisa's affair with a younger woman named Diane. Not my place, so I tried to keep it lighthearted not to allow the awkwardness to spoil the evening. By and by, the evening wore round. All of us were drinking and laughing, affecting not to notice the deeper undercurrent of tension. 10 p.m. before we knew it, there was a tinkle at the doorbell. Trick or treat! came the muffled voice from the porch. Jack, always being an obliging host, stood up and take the bowl of candy. I get it, he said, going to the door. There was something that did not feel right. I tracked him into the foyer but kept well back, hiding behind the shadows of the hallway. This horrible feeling crept over me that something bad was going to happen. Opening the door, Jack expected trick-or-treaters. Instead, a figure in a grotesque mask stood there, holding a brown paper bag. Before Jack could react, he pulled out a gun and shot him in the face. Jack collapsed instantly, and candy spilled everywhere. I stood frozen in terror, holding my breath as I stared at the scene from the dark hallway. Screaming, Lisa stood by, but there was something strange about her, though it was almost as though she had been waiting for this moment to arrive. The masked intruder entered another step into the house to look for witness. My heart stammered, and I shrunk back into the shadows further. Help! Someone phone the police! She finally screamed, breaking out of her trance. Diane sped from the living room, panic etched across her face. She had dashed right into the masked figure. It started to raise the gun once more. No witnesses. The figure hissed. My survival instincts kicked in. I turned to run and bumped into a table, sending a glass crashing to the floor. The shattering sound would give me away. The intruder's head jerked in my direction, and I knew it was my turn. I sprinted toward the back door as the killer pounded down behind me. I leapt out into the backyard, clearing a low fence into the next yard over, as the neighbor peered out across his property line, looking irritated. I couldn't breathe but didn't stop as I weaved through the maze of yards. I hit the street and saw a police car parked at the end of the block. I signaled them down, breathless and frantic. Help! My friend's been shot! The killer's after me! I gasped, pointing back towards Jack's house. The cops didn't wait. They sped toward the house with me in tow. When we arrived, the house was deathly quiet. Inside, we found Lisa cradling Jack's body, sobbing uncontrollably. Diane was gone, and there was no sign of the masked intruder. I took my statement and elaborated on the masked man who had given me this ride and the horrifying chase to the police. Next, I mentioned Lisa's weird reaction and Diane's disappearance in a flash. The cops assured me that they would investigate all these leads. 
days pass, and then finally, with a dare to be potent, the investigation peels off the dark secrets of the Marlowe household. As Lisa and Diane continued to facilitate the romantic affair between them, resentment toward Jack continued to grow. The killing attack was definitely premeditated. It didn't take long before Diane was discovered and, under pressure, confessed to her role in the plot, implicating Lisa and revealing the identity of the masked killer, a hitman hired to get rid of Jack. The murder proved to be a gruesome, horrific crime. The trial that followed gripped Greenwood. It chilled to the bones to hear details about the Halloween murder. Lisa and the killer who she hired got a life sentence in prison. Diane had cooperated with the law and thus was given a lesser sentence, but would never outlive that fateful night. I fought against the pain but gave it to justice. I promised myself to live with the memory of Jack, haunted by the events he witnessed and having his life snatched away from him on an evening that could have been just another innocent night. It is the tale of a Halloween intruder, a legendary reminder of how familiar faces mask impenetrable darkness and of the hairline thickness of a line separating love from infidelity. And every Halloween, as kids roam the streets in their costumes, I go back to that night and my lost friend. I never thought working at a five-star resort like Coral Cove would be anything but peaceful. The pristine beaches, the turquoise waves, and the rich guests. It was supposed to be a dream job, but there's something no one tells you about working in luxury hotels. The corridors, the rooms, the hidden corners, they all have their secrets. I've cleaned enough suites to know that the most beautiful places can hide the darkest things. I was on the night shift when they checked in. Room 803, a mother and daughter, Elizabeth and Lily. They arrived like any other guests. Elizabeth was elegant, the kind of woman who spoke with a soft confidence, and her daughter, Lily, was, well, different. Something about her put me on edge from the start. She didn't look at her mother when she spoke, always glancing away, fidgeting like something was eating her up inside. I wouldn't have paid them much mind if it weren't for the strange request they made the same evening. Around midnight, just as I was finishing up my rounds, Lily came down to the front desk. She was with a man, a stranger, tall, with dark eyes that felt too calm. His name was Marcus, and he was Lily's boyfriend. They were hushed, whispering to the receptionist. The two of them wanted an extra key for room 803 without Elizabeth knowing. That didn't sit right with me. I tried to shrug it off. Guests do weird things all the time. The next morning, I was assigned to clean their room. When I knocked, no one answered. Standard procedure is to go in if no one's around, so I unlocked the door. What greeted me was a mess. A broken fruit bowl, glass shards scattered across the floor, and a sickly sweet smell that turned my stomach. I've cleaned enough rooms to know the scent of death, even when it's masked by expensive perfume. I wasn't prepared for what I found. The suitcase, a big black one, sitting by the edge of the bed. As I approached, the smell intensified, and my heart started racing. Something was leaking from the bottom, a dark, sticky liquid. My hands shook as I reached for the zipper, but before I could even touch it, Lily walked in. Her eyes were wide and frantic. Behind her was Marcus, calm as ever, like the storm hadn't touched him at all. They froze when they saw me standing by the suitcase. What are you doing here? Lily's voice trembled. I... I was just cleaning. I stammered, my gaze darting between them and the suitcase. I didn't touch anything. Marcus stepped forward, blocking my path to the door. His eyes were cold, too cold for someone so young. You need to leave. Nodding, I slowly backed away. I'll come back later. Lily looked like she was going to cry. Her hands were trembling as she fiddled with the hem of her shirt. I wanted to reach out, to ask if she was okay, but Marcus's presence stopped me. He didn't say another word, just watched me with that unsettling stillness as I slipped out of the room and into the hallway. I didn't breathe until I was far away, tucked into a storage closet where I could pull myself together. My mind raced, something horrible had happened in that room. I could feel it, sense it, and whatever was in that suitcase, it wasn't luggage. 
I rushed to tell my supervisor, but by the time we got back to room 803, it was too late. The suitcase was gone, and so were Lily and Marcus. The room was eerily clean, as if nothing had ever been out of place. But I knew better. I'd seen it. I'd smelled it. Elizabeth was gone, and I had a sinking feeling I knew where she was. Hours later, the resort was buzzing. Security footage showed the couple leaving with the suitcase, handing it off to a taxi driver who didn't know what he was carrying. They were found a few hours later, hiding in a cheap motel across town, arrested. Lily cried when they cuffed her, but Marcus didn't flinch. He just stared straight ahead, as if none of it mattered. Within hours, it was all over the news of how a greedy daughter killed her own mother with the help of her psycho boyfriend. Elizabeth had been wealthy, very wealthy. Her husband, Lily's father, had passed away not too long ago, leaving behind a large inheritance. But Elizabeth held tight to it, refusing to give Lily and Marcus any of it until Lily was older, more responsible, she'd said. And that's where Marcus came in. He didn't care about responsibility, he wanted the money, and he wanted it fast. Together, they'd planned it out. Lily lured her mother to Bali, under the guise of a bonding trip, while Marcus followed days later. Elizabeth never saw it coming. I couldn't sleep that night. The image of that suitcase and Elizabeth's bloodied body lying inside it haunted me as the weight of what I almost opened pressed onto my chest. I tried to forget to push it out of my mind, but some things stick with you. The whispers in the hallways, the way the air felt colder after they left, it was like the hotel itself was holding onto that darkness. Even now, years later, I can't shake the memory of that night. I still work at Coral Cove, and every time I pass room 803, I get a chill. It's strange how paradise can turn into a nightmare so quickly, how easily people can hide the worst parts of themselves behind smiles and luxury. I've cleaned countless rooms since then, but I'll never forget that smell, that suitcase, and the cold, dead eyes of Marcus and Lily. Sometimes I wonder if the island remembers too. All this time, desperation accompanied me and I could think of nothing else to do. When I noticed the ads for a secretary, I took it. It was quite a normal advertisement. An elderly woman required a secretary to answer on many kinds of tasks sounding simple, which at that point I took my life for all that simpler. Mrs. Thorne, the elderly lady, replied promptly to my application and asked me to come over to her place for my first day at work. Her address led me to an old sprawling house on the outskirts of town. It had a creepy charm to it, but I declined paying heed to the uneasy feelings creeping up my spine. This was my chance to put my life back on track. When Mrs. Thorne opened the door, she warmly invited me in. She was frail and sharp-eyed, seeming to see right through me. Would you like some tea before we begin? She asked, her voice as creaky as the floorboards under my feet. And to make a good impression, I agreed. I remember the bitter taste of the tea. It was warm yet cold simultaneously. As I continued drinking, my sight became blurry, my body limp. And this is what I remember last, Mrs. Thorne's wicked smile. There was no dawn, yet my eyes snapped open to find myself lying in a musty, dimly lit basement where chains bit deep into my wrists. The air inside was icy damp, without a sound other than the drip of water far away echoing from some other room. Panic overwhelmed me as I strained against the chains, which did not budge an inch. Mrs. Thorne stepped into view at the top of the stairs as she slowly descended them in eerily tranquil movement. Welcome back, dear, she said, her voice chillingly serene. What's... what's all this? Why am I... <laughs> You have a task to complete. She handed me a set of tools and some wooden boards. Build your coffin. She commanded. My eyes snapped open in horror. I shrieked for help. Are you insane? Let me go right now. But Mrs. Thorne only laughed. <laughs> See that on your leg? Then pointed to my ankle, an odd device. A bangle-like thing was attached to my right ankle. 
I watched Mrs. Thorne taking out a small remote, then pressing a red button on it. Electricity surged through my body. I convulsed and barely could keep myself from crying out. Now, are you going to do as I say? She asked, her eyes glinting with malevolent glee. I nodded, shuddering in agony. I began hammering the coffin together as my brain twisted and contorted for an escape. As Mrs. Thorne spoke sick fantasies to me while laboring, I found out she wanted to have buried a person alive and then all her life listened to the screams. Her voice dripped with sadistic pleasure and I knew I wasn't her first victim, but I vowed to be the last. Mrs. Thorne didn't know anything about my dark past. I had worked for a secret hitman agency in Mexico. Wanting to start fresh brought me back to the States. My stealth and combat skills weren't, however, on par with the point at which the agency was paying. I meant to use them as my ticket through this nightmare. As I knelt to set the coffin upright, loosening the gear on my ankle with the screwdriver dangling from my hip was merely an automatic act. Every motion was swift and controlled the byproduct of the years of discipline. Mrs. Thorne remained oblivious to my intentions as she basked in her sadistic fantasy. Finally, I released the anklet. With a jerky motion, I flung myself at Mrs. Thorne, knocking her down to the floor. Although thin and fragile, she seemed to exert untold strength and struggling. My greater strength in the end won. I strapped the device to her wrist and grasped the remote. Now, you shall obey me. I hissed through icy arrogance. From then onwards, tables turned. Mrs. Thorne became afraid and was bound to do follow my orders. For the next three days, I forced her to write a will, where she left all her properties to me. Next three months straight, I played the good secretary. The neighbors got used to my kind disposition toward the elderly Mrs. Thorne. I ensured that everyone had my side as the dutiful caretaker of that old granny. These three months, Mrs. Thorne laid like a broccoli around the house, and then one fine day I put Mrs. Thorne into a wheelchair and placed her above the stairs. She knew the end and begged for her life. With a cold, emotionless expression, I hit the button on the remote. Mrs. Thorne convulsed in anguish as her convulsive movements rolled the wheelchair over. She fell down the stairs, her neck snapping with a grotesque crack. The death was ruled an accident. That was when the lawyer finally called me and told me that Mrs. Thorne had willed everything to me. I pretended to cry and told him how sorry I was and that she was close to me. I demanded some kind of memorial and funeral should be done to pay respects to the dead owner. During the funeral, I made Mrs. Thorne lie in that coffin which I had built under compulsion. As the coffin was lowered into the grave, I sat there and looked at it. My face was unreadable since I had survived and had ensured the future generations would not have to pass through what I did. But, for sure, the darkness of my past and what I went through will forever be seen as marks against my soul. It's strange how close someone can come to your heart without you ever realizing they're slowly squeezing it, draining life away with every beat. Claudia and I were sisters in every sense of the word, except blood. Ever since I met her 20 years back at a charity event, she'd been there through everything. My marriage, Jake's birth, my divorce. When Mike left, it was Claudia who stood by my side, mopping my tears and helping me piece together my shattered life. Jake loved her too. So, when I had my hip surgery, I didn't think twice about letting her practically move in to help. I trusted her with everything. She cooked, cleaned, and took care of Jake. She was my rock, always smiling that warm, understanding smile. But then the cracks began to show, tiny things, almost invisible at first. The sickness had started shortly after Jake's 17th birthday, a simple cold at first, nothing to be concerned about. Then it grew and kept growing until the fatigue became unbearable, creeping into my bones. No matter how much I rested, it only deteriorated. I was in and out of the doctor's office, subjecting myself to tests that gave no answers. No matter what I tried, no matter how many pills they shoved down my throat, my body was failing me. It wasn't until later I got to know that it wasn't just my body failing. Claudia began acting strange. She was quieter around Jake, visibly more nervous. At first, I ignored it. What was there to doubt? 
She was a mother figure for Jake, right? And the stress of caring for me and Jake couldn't have been easy. I asked her about it once. We were sitting in my dimly lit living room, the cold shadows pressing against the walls like silent spectators. Claudia giggled nervously. Jake ain't our tiny boy anymore, Lila. He is growing up and learning things that he wants to experience. Claudia avoided my eyes, but I had seen it. The wave of disgust had almost knocked me over. I needed to have a chat with Jake. That afternoon, Claudia was out shopping when I brought it up with Jake. We were alone, and the house was heavy with the kind of silence that bruises deep into your skin. Jake? I started, my voice shaky. What is Claudia to you? He looked at me, confused at first, then his nostrils flared. My son was furious at the accusation. He suggested I'd interrogate her friend instead. She had been suggesting me things, Mom. The way he said it, his voice strained, almost panicked, sent a shiver down my spine. I kept quiet because I didn't want to stress you out. I dismissed his claims of innocence, a growing teen fueled by hormones, seeing things that weren't there. Claudia had always treated him like her own son. It had to be him. You don't understand, Mom. He snapped, his face flushed with frustration. I'll prove it to you. I should have listened, but instead I brushed him off. That night, my malaise worsened. My skin felt cold and clammy. My breath came in shallow gasps. I was trapped in my body, helpless as it collapsed under the weight of an illness I could not understand. I laboriously dragged my sweaty body towards Claudia's room, hoping to get help. Little did I know, I was in for the biggest shock of my life. I overheard Claudia. She was on the phone to someone. Her voice was a low, eerie whisper. I'm going to take him away forever. She said, him? Her words clawed at my mind, sending a wave of nausea through me. Who was she talking to? What did she mean? Before I could confront her, Jake stormed in and dragged me out to the hospital, pale and frantic. In his hands, he held vials, small glass containers, and petri dishes he'd found hidden in Claudia's room earlier. He showed me the labels, words I didn't understand, but they reeked of a lethal scheme. My mind spun. I didn't want to believe it. Not Claudia. Not her. But deep down, I knew. I immediately rang Dr. Maya, an old colleague from my nursing days, begging her to help me. She ran the tests, and when the results came back, they shattered what little remained of my world. The infections weren't natural. They were induced. Someone had been slowly poisoning me, introducing resistant bacteria into my system. That someone was Claudia. The realization hit me like a freight train. The woman I'd trusted with my life, my son's life, had been killing me, slowly, methodically, for months, all to take Jake away. I couldn't breathe. Dr. Maya called the authorities. Detective O'Hara, an investigator, took over, and soon the FBI got involved. They set a trap. Claudia had been expecting another shipment of the bacteria. This time, they intercepted it. The night they arrested her, I watched from the window as they pulled her away in handcuffs. She fought, screamed, and denied everything, but under the weight of the evidence, she had to crack. Claudia confessed how she believed I wasn't fit to raise Jake and didn't deserve Mike. She thought I was a failure, and everyone involved in my life deserved better. Removing her was necessary. She screamed. I shuddered when the police car's red and blue lights faded into the night. Claudia was gone, but her shadow lingered, a stain I'd never be able to wash away. Claudia was everything Jake and I talked about for days to come. We had survived, but the world felt colder now, darker. There was no more illusions left, just the terrifying truth that the truth might be what the eyes couldn't see, and everything that we see isn't always the truth. I was assigned to clean and inspect the Phantom's Fury, the roller coaster which had sat idle for over a decade in the farthest corner of a closed down section of Six Flags. Now, it felt like a mausoleum, a tomb for the spirits of the past. The park still buzzed on the other side with life that day, families laughing, children squealing with delight, yet I was drawn to that forgotten section like a moth to a flame. 
I had heard the whispers about the ride. There was a malfunction, and lives were lost when a rake's guardrails swung open and many people fell to their deaths. It did not make much waves in the national news due to the major political scandal that broke the same day, but there was a strange vibe to that section. Hey, Avery, my colleague Lucas called. You really think it's safe to go back there? It's just an inspection so we can move with the cleanup. I replied, waving him off. What's the worst that can happen? Just saying, people say there's a lot of bad blood here. I'll be fine. I assured him, forcing a smile. As I ventured deeper into the overgrown section, the vibrant sounds of joy faded, replaced by an unsettling silence that wrapped around me like a heavy cloak. The sun had set and a coldness enveloped the air. Everything there was in a state of decay and rot. I stepped closer to the coaster, my boots crunching on gravel. That's when I heard it, a soft clattering, like an old chain dragging along the tracks. At first, I thought it was a figment of my imagination, but each step brought the sound closer, more pronounced. It felt rhythmic, mechanical, yet hollow. Stop it, Avery. I muttered, forcing myself to move forward. The clattering morphed into distant screams, but they weren't joyful shrieks. No, these were panic-stricken, desperate cries rising in intensity before abruptly cutting off. I stood frozen, breath caught in my throat, trying to convince myself that it was just the wind, but fear settled deep in my gut. I was midway into my inspection when I heard the screams again, but this time the ground vibrated beneath me. It felt as if the very earth was alive, pulsating with a rhythm I couldn't comprehend. I took a step back, but the sensation clung to me, an unsettling reminder about this place. Just finish this inspection and get out of here. As I passed a rusted ride car, a cold gust of wind rushed past me, sharp and unnatural, leaving the scent of burning oil in its wake. The contrast with the warm summer air sent a shiver up my spine. I shook my head, but then came the moment that shattered any remaining semblance of rationality. I reached for one of the decaying seat belts, analyzing the condition of the material, but as my fingers brushed against the frayed material, it jerked away from me, snapping back as though pulled away by an unseen force. My heart came into my mouth, and I retreated my steps. There were no explanation, no logic to grasp onto just an overwhelming sense that I was not alone. I carefully reached for it again, but this time, everything was normal. So I took a deep breath in and carried on with my work, but I couldn't ignore the terrible stench. It clung to the air and made my stomach churn. Few minutes later, the atmosphere grew heavier, suffocating, and then the noises surged around me, clattering of chains, faint screams, gusts of cold air. The vibrations beneath my feet intensified, making my knees buckle slightly. The atmosphere thickened, clinging to my skin like a shroud. It felt as though the ride had awakened, coming alive. Then, without warning, a rusted car lurched forward along the track. I froze, horror clawing at my insides as the sound of clattering chains roared around me. The ride, long dormant, had somehow revived. My stomach twisted as the first car ascended the height of the tracks, its rusty wheels squealing in protest. What I saw next etched itself into my mind forever. Strapped into the decaying seats were ghostly figures, their bodies twisted and disfigured, trapped in the moment before their demise. They were translucent, their faces were hollow, devoid of expression, as if all hope had been snuffed out. But what haunted me the most were their hands, lifeless, yet raised in a mockery of joy. No, this can't be happening. I gasped, staggering back. As the car plummeted down the first drop, their hollowed faces turned towards me, and I heard the faintest whisper, Join us. The world around me blurred, my heart raced, and panic consumed me. I didn't think, I ran. I stumbled backward, nearly tripping over my own feet as I bolted away from the phantom's fury. The cacophony of chains and hollow screams chased me. In that moment, I understood the truth. 
the ride was alive, holding on to its lost souls, and I was merely a trespasser in their domain. As I fled, I could still feel the vibrations in the ground beneath me, a haunting reminder that some stories are never meant to be forgotten, and some places are better left alone. Moving in with a new roommate was supposed to be a fresh start. After a messy breakup and the end of my lease, finding Megan's ad for a room felt like a stroke of luck. The apartment was charming, a vintage two-bedroom and hardwood floors and a small balcony overlooking the city. Megan was quiet and a little weird looking. She had big dark circles and red eyes. On the first night, as I unpacked boxes in my new room, I heard faint scraping noises coming from the walls. It was a rhythmic sound, like nails dragging across plaster. I pressed my ear against the cold surface. Is someone there? Silence. At breakfast the next morning, I mentioned it casually. Hey, do you ever hear weird noises at night? Like, scratching? Megan looked up from her tea, her expression unreadable. It's an old building. It makes sounds. She sipped slowly, her gaze lingering on me just a moment too long. Days passed and the unsettling noises continued. One evening, I noticed tiny holes in the walls of my bedroom, almost imperceptible. They were strategically placed, one facing my bed, another the bathroom. Peering through one, I saw only darkness. I grabbed some tape and paper, covering them up. But the next morning, the coverings were gone. The holes seemed wider. A sense of violation washed over me. I confronted Megan. Did you remove the paper I put on my wall? She glanced at me, eyes reflecting the dim kitchen light. Why would I go into your room? Maybe you imagined putting them up? That night, sleep eluded me. Every creak of the apartment amplified my paranoia. Around 2 a.m., I heard the scraping again, louder this time, almost agitated. It seemed to move along the wall, stopping right behind my headboard. I whispered into the darkness. Who are you? What do you want? A faint giggle echoed in response. The following day, I found my closet door ajar. Clothes I hadn't worn were missing. Hours later, they reappeared, folded neatly on my bed. A scent clung to them, a mix of damp earth and something sweet, almost rotten. I decided to stay out late, avoiding the apartment. At a coffee shop, I opened my laptop to distract myself, but the webcam light flickered on in the middle. I frowned, clicking to disable it. Moments later, an anonymous message popped up on my screen. Why don't you want me to see you? My heart raced. Who is this? No response. I slammed the laptop shut and headed home. In my room, I locked the door and pushed a chair against it. Exhausted, I collapsed onto the bed, clutching a kitchen knife under my pillow. Sometime during the night, I felt a presence. My eyes fluttered open to see Megan standing at the foot of my bed, her silhouette illuminated by the faint glow of the streetlights outside. Megan? What are you doing? She tilted her head. You were screaming. I wanted to make sure you're okay. I hadn't screamed. Please, get out. She lingered for a moment before slipping out of the room. The next morning, I decided I couldn't stay there any longer. I began packing, determined to leave by nightfall. As I gathered my things, a small flash drive fell out of one of my boxes. I didn't recognize it. Curiosity overrode caution. Plugging it into the laptop, I opened the only folder on it labeled For Claire. Dozens of video files appeared, each marked with a date. Clicking on the most recent one, my screen filled with a grainy night vision recording of my bedroom. I watched in horror as footage played of me sleeping, tossing and turning. The timestamp was from the night before. My breath caught as the camera panned, revealing Megan standing in the corner watching me. Her eyes gleamed unnaturally in the infrared light. I clicked on another file. It showed me in the bathroom, undressing for a shower. Tears blurred my vision as I realized the extent of the invasion. A final file sat at the bottom of the list, titled, Tonight. With a shaking hand, I opened it. It was a live feed of my room. 
From the angle, it was clear the camera was inside the wall. Suddenly, the video shook and a message flashed across the screen. I'm coming. A loud thud resonated from the hallway. Panic surged through me. I grabbed my phone to call the police, but there was no signal. The lights flickered and then went out, plunging the apartment into darkness. Footsteps approached. The doorknob rattled. Claire, let me in. Her voice was distorted. I backed away, clutching the knife. The door creaked open. It shouldn't have. I'd locked it. She stood there, but something was wrong. Her limbs were too long, joints bending at unnatural angles. Her face was dark, eyes sunken deep. You shouldn't have tried to leave. I screamed, darting past her and into the hallway. From behind, I heard the scraping, the same I'd heard in the walls, now amplified, chasing me. Bursting into the living room, I found the front door, but it wouldn't budge. Megan's laughter echoed. Desperate, I smashed a window with a nearby chair and crawled out, cutting myself on the shards. I ran into the night, not stopping until I reached a brightly lit gas station. The attendant stared as I stumbled in, disheveled and bleeding. Miss, are you okay? I tried to explain, words tumbling incoherently. They called the police, who arrived swiftly. I told them everything, about Megan, the cameras, the flash drive. An officer frowned. Ma'am, that building's been abandoned for years. My blood turned to ice. No. I moved in last week. Megan is my roommate. They exchanged glances. We'll take a look. But the last tenant in that apartment was a woman named Margaret, who died decades ago. They escorted me back. The building stood ahead, windows boarded up, graffiti covering the walls. Inside, dust coated every surface. My belongings were nowhere to be seen. In the apartment where I'd lived, only decay remained. But in the center of the living room sat a single item, a vintage camcorder on a tripod, pointing towards the door. Attached was a note in familiar handwriting. Thank you for the performance. I stared in disbelief. The officers guided me outside as I trembled uncontrollably. It's funny how desperation makes you take what you can get, even if it's the worst. The moment I stepped out of prison after seven years, it felt like the world had moved on. Not that I could blame anyone. My identity was stained, associated with theft, vandalism, and crime. The only luxury I was left was my old jalopy and sausage sandwiches. So when I found the ad for a job as a housekeeper in Caroline's villa, I didn't think twice. No more sleazy part-time jobs at Hooters. No more drunken creeps treating me like crap. I just wanted something to keep me off the streets. The interview was unsettling. Caroline, the lady of the house, was a 75-year-old widow. From the second I saw her, something felt wrong. Her smile stretched too far like it didn't belong in her face. Her eyes darted around, wild and jittery. Then, without warning, she let out this soft, eerie giggle that sent a chill down my spine. I caught her lips moving, whispering to herself, too quiet to make out. My gut screamed at me to leave, but I needed this job. There's not much to do. Just clean and help look after my son Judas. She said, her eyes widening. He's been... resting. My daughter Dahlia likes to keep to herself. Caroline's laugh filled the room, a high-pitched, eerie sound that made my skin crawl. Dahlia's a good girl. Quiet, though. She doesn't talk much, just stares. Despite the weird vibes, I took the job. What else was I going to do? Sleep in my car forever? I packed up my few belongings and moved in the next morning. The house was huge, but not in the grand, cozy way you'd expect. No, it was dark and musty, and every corner felt like somebody's going to jump out at you. Caroline showed me to my attic room. You'll start tomorrow, Caroline said, grinning again. There's only one rule. Never step outside your room past midnight. The attic door slammed shut behind her, and I was alone with my thoughts in a mess outside. The world stuck with me as I lay down. I didn't sleep well. The sound of wind scraping against the old windows, mixed with the faint hum of whispers from below, kept me on edge. 
By morning, I was already regretting my decision. Ignoring everything, I started cleaning. The house was a disaster. Caroline and Dahlia lived like they had five lives. The filth touched the roof, dirty towels everywhere, dishes crusted with old food. The bathroom was a horror of its own. But my nightmare was Judas's room. He was in a coma, she'd said. So when I walked in, I wasn't expecting the stench of bleach to burn my nose. His room was spotless, like a hospital ward, but the air was thick with chemicals. Judas lay motionless on the bed, pale and sickly. For a moment, I could swear he wasn't breathing at all, but the beeping of the heart monitor reassured me. By nightfall, I was exhausted and passed out the moment I fell on the bed. It had to be around 1 a.m. when it happened. An ear-piercing scream smacked me right out of bed. My heart nearly fell off my mouth when the screams came again, sharp and desperate. Without thinking, I grabbed my flashlight and bolted downstairs. My steps halted outside of Judas's room. The door was slightly open, and the bed, his bed, was empty. The heart monitor was off, the sheets were rumpled, but there was no sign of Judas. My breath caught in my throat. Could he have woken up? Could someone in a coma just get up? A low guttural chant echoed from the basement. My feet moved on their own, carrying me towards the sound. I should have turned around. I should have run out of that house and never looked back. But I couldn't. My legs had grown a mind of their own. I crept down the stairs, one slow step after another until I reached the basement door. It was ajar, and an eerie orange light flickered from within. The scene inside had me frozen. Caroline was hunched over a wooden plank, her hands hovering over Judas's still body. The guy wasn't in a coma. He was gone. Gray skin, lips sunken, eyes half open. It wasn't Judas, but his corpse. And beside Caroline, Dahlia stood shivering like a leaf. Her eyes were wide with terror. What the hell are you doing? I yelled, not knowing it could be my worst mistake. Caroline's head snapped up, her eyes wild. The woman was possessed. Be quiet. I'm bringing him back. She screamed. Next, I was flung backward, crashing into a shelf as Caroline wrapped her claws around my neck. White spots danced in my vision, but just before a complete blackout could take over, Dahlia somehow swung a heavy candlestick square at her mother. Caroline collapsed, unconscious. Dahlia dropped to her knees, sobbing uncontrollably. I tried to stop her, she whispered, her voice trembling. Judas died five days ago. He fell down the stairs. Mama, she wouldn't accept it. She said the practice could bring him back. The bile rose in my throat as the realization hit hard. The smell, the bleach, the chemicals, it all made sense now. Caroline had been clinging to her son. We immediately rang the cops, but I was already gone before they arrived. I didn't wait for explanations, didn't want to hear them. As I drove away, my eyes glued to the rearview mirror. I half expected to see Caroline's deranged face grinning back at me, but there was only darkness. I could be free from that house, but I would never be free of its dreadful memory. I had been planning the beach trip for weeks, a chance to unwind before finals and celebrate turning 21. My uncle Robert had offered his luxurious beach house, a modern glass structure perched on a private stretch of coastline. It was the perfect getaway, and my friends couldn't wait. As we pulled up the long driveway, the house stood like a jewel against the backdrop of waves. My friend Mia leaned out of the car window in amazement. Ethan and Liam, our friends from college, unloaded the bags while Sarah, always the photographer, snapped pictures of everything. Inside, the house was even more impressive. Open spaces, sleek furnishings, and floor-to-ceiling windows offering panoramic ocean views. We chose our rooms and settled in, laughter filling the halls. That afternoon, we hit the beach. The water was perfect, and the stress of school melted away. Later, as we lounged on the deck, Mia frowned at her phone. That's weird. Everything okay? She showed me a photo on her screen. It was of her, from earlier today, standing on the beach. But the angle was off, as if taken from a distance. 
I didn't take this. And no one else had my phone. Maybe you took it by accident? Mia shook her head. I know my photos. This wasn't me. We tried to laugh it off, but an uneasy feeling settled among us. That evening, Sarah went to shower. Later, she emerged, wrapped in a robe, her dark hair dripping. Did someone come into the bathroom? No, why? My towel's gone. I took yours. We searched, but it was gone. A couple of hours later, a scream echoed from her room. We rushed in to find Sarah staring at her bed. There lay her towel, neatly folded, with a note on top. I see you. Ethan's eyes narrowed. Very funny, guys. We all denied it. The moon shifted from playful to tense. That night, as darkness enveloped the house, I heard faint footsteps above. I sat up in bed, listening. The steps moved slowly, deliberately. I nudged Mia, who was sharing the room. Is there someone on the roof? We woke the others and sent the boys to investigate, who found nothing. The next morning, Liam decided to take a swim to clear his head. When he returned, his face was pale. All right, who's messing with me? He pointed to his shoes, which were hanging atop a tree near the patio. Ethan glanced around suspiciously. Could there really be someone spying on us? Determined to uncover the truth, we agreed to search the house thoroughly. In one of the guest bedrooms, Ethan noticed the air vent looked tampered with. Hand me a chair. He stood up and peered inside, then recoiled. There's a camera in there. What? He pulled out a small device, wires trailing behind it. Why would there be a camera? A heavy silence fell. We gathered in the living room. Do you think someone's been watching us? Liam paced. This is insane. Who would do this? Maybe someone broke in. But there were no signs of forced entry. The realization hit me like a wave. What if... What if it's someone we know? All eyes turned to me. My uncle has always been... eccentric. I recalled how eager he was for us to visit, the odd way he smiled when he handed me the keys. I don't know, but we need to get out of here. We hurried to pack our things, but as we approached the front door, it slammed shut. Uncle Robert stood there, his usually neat appearance disheveled, eyes wild red. Leaving so soon? Mr. Hayes? What's going on? He smiled eerily. Just ensuring my guests are entertained. Ethan stepped forward. The game's just begun. Panic set in. We backed away as he advanced. Why are you doing this? He chuckled. Observation, my dear. To capture raw emotion, fear, desperation. It's pure art. Liam lunged, trying to push past him, but Uncle Robert was surprisingly strong, shoving him back and pulling out a gun. Now, now, no need for violence. Ethan grabbed a lamp, smashing it against the wall to create a distraction. We scattered, racing through the house. I could hear Uncle Robert's footsteps behind us, his laughter echoing. I ducked into the study, searching for anything that could help. On the desk lay a series of photographs, candid shots of us from the weekend, each one more invasive than the last. We need to find another way out. The basement. There's a door that leads outside. We regrouped and made our way to the basement. The room was filled with monitors, displaying live feeds from hidden cameras. Our every move had been watched. Sarah covered her mouth, but then Uncle Robert's voice boomed over a speaker. There's no escape. Ethan found a metal rod and pried open a small window. One by one, we crawled out into the night. Outside, the wind howled and the waves crashed violently against the shore. We sprinted toward the car, but the tires were slashed. What now? Headlights appeared in the distance, a car approaching. Desperate, we waved it down. It was a police cruiser. I rushed forward. Please help us. My uncle's trying to hurt us. That is when Uncle Robert emerged from the house, his face twisted in rage. You're mine. The officer got us into the car, radioed for backup, and sped away. 
At the station, we learned the truth. Uncle Robert had a history of voyeurism and psychological manipulation. The authorities had been tracking him after previous incidents, but he'd always evaded capture. I can't believe I didn't see it. I should have known something was off. Ethan put his arm around me. You couldn't have predicted this. My uncle was imprisoned, but using his pull, he got out in just eight months. He promised that he wouldn't contact us again, but with such a sick person out, there's always that terrible feeling of being watched upon. Halloween night has always been just another date on the calendar for me. While people partied in ridiculous costumes, I was at my office, huddled over a dimly lit screen. Fixing code was my life, and that night was no different. So, when Julian, my co-worker, called about a file crash, I didn't think twice before heading in to fix it. By the time I was done, it was close to 1.30 a.m. The streets were deathly quiet, while the moon was a merely cold, distant eye overhead. I was so damn tired that all I could think about was getting home, taking a long shower, and crashing into bed. Fifteen minutes, that's all it would have taken. The night air was heavy and still as I drove through the empty roads, totally normal. But as I passed an old, almost forgotten bus stop, I saw her, a girl standing alone under the flickering streetlight. She was dressed like Samara from The Ring, pale skin, dark hair hanging in wet clumps over her face. She couldn't have been older than 14, standing there all alone in the dead of night. I pulled over and rolled down the window. Hey, you need a ride? I called out. She turned slowly, her face still hidden beneath the curtain of hair. For a moment, I hesitated. What if she took me for a creep and rang the cops? But then she nodded timidly. Th thanks. She slid into the passenger seat. Suddenly, a pungent odor like damp earth and something else, something rotten, filled the interior. I tried not to gag and blamed it on her overzealous Halloween costume. You really went for the look, didn't you? I giggled, trying to lighten the mood. Her skin was an eerie shade of gray, mottled and blotchy, as if she'd been underwater for far too long. The attention to detail was disturbing. It wasn't until we drove across the bridge that she spoke. It's not a costume. She whispered. I let out a nervous laugh. Right, so what's your name? Samara. She replied. Even though my eyes were glued on the road, I couldn't help the chill creeping down my spine. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> uh, aren't you a little old for trick-or-treating, Samara? She uh, laughed then, a low, rasping sound that made my skin crawl. I am, but Halloween is my favorite night. It's a shame my parents don't let me celebrate anymore. Why's that? I asked, regretting the question the moment it left my mouth. They think I'm sick. I spend most days locked up in the attic. Her voice was barely a whisper, but the words clung to the air, heavy and suffocating. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. Before I could react, Samara slowly turned to me. Her hideous face was fully visible in the soft light. I noticed her skin first, peeling, hanging in ragged strips from her cheeks. It didn't look like makeup. Then, my eyes traveled down to her arms and the raw red flesh exposing beneath it. You want to see a magic trick? She asked, her lips curling into a smile that sent ice through my veins. Before I could respond, she reached up and peeled a patch of skin from her face. It came off in one sickening tear, revealing more of that oozing crimson flesh. I had never slammed on the brakes like that before. What the hell is wrong with you? I shouted. But she just laughed, started pulling at more patches of skin, ripping it from her neck, her arms, her scalp, everywhere. Blood dripped onto her lap, and the smell, oh god, the smell, thick and putrid, filled the air. I couldn't breathe, my vision blurred, my hands trembling as I fumbled for the door handle. The air was thick, choking me, and that laughter, it wouldn't stop. I threw myself out of the car, my feet stumbling as I broke into a run. I could hear my heart beating in my ears. I didn't look back. I couldn't. 
I don't know how long I ran, but eventually I found myself at a gas station. The harsh fluorescent lights felt like salvation. I staggered inside, breathless, as I tried explaining the incident to the clerk. In a second, the cops were informed. The officers arrived quickly, and when I explained what had happened, they exchanged looks that were to remain my nightmare for the rest of my life. They didn't think I was crazy, but their silence was almost verbal. They escorted me back to the car. I was still there, the engine idling softly, but the passenger seat was empty. Instead, an older couple was standing by the side of the road. Their faces were contorted with worry. The officer spoke to them briefly before turning to me. Mr. Miller, this is Mr. and Mrs. Peterson, one of the cops said. Their daughter, Mary, she's been missing since last week. I stared at the couple, my mind struggling to connect the dots. Mary? She's... she's not well. Mrs. Peterson said, her voice trembling. She had a fever years ago. It's... It did something to her skin. The bullying at school broke her irreparably. Mary thinks she's Samara. You know that girl from the horror movie, The Ring? Was drowned in a well for being weird and creepy. I felt the blood drain from my face. The girl, she wasn't some ghost. She was real. All of it. Everything she said, it was real. And it's even more twisted that she found similarities with the dead girl from the movie Ring. The cops asked where I'd last seen her, but I could barely get the words out. My mind kept flashing back to her peeling skin, her laughter. I mumbled something about the bus stop. As they drove off, a cold dread settled in. What if they didn't find her in time? What if she hurt herself or someone else? Halloween is about masks and make-believe. But sometimes, we can barely tell if it's a costume or... So, it was the beginning of July when me, Leela, and Jess pulled into the driveway of our rented beach house at Gilgo Beach. We were so ready for the weekend, an escape from the city, some sun, a few drinks, and just chilling by the ocean. The place was perfect, too. This cute little beach house with these huge windows that looked right out at the ocean. It felt like our own little slice of paradise. The beach was quiet that morning, almost too quiet. It didn't disturb us, we were in full vacation mode. By the time we unpacked, it was already dawn, and we decided to take a splash while the beach was still quite unpopulated. The sky was all orange and pink as we ran toward the water, laughing and splashing around. The ocean felt so refreshing, and we were having the time of our lives until I noticed him. At first, I didn't even give it a second glance. There was this guy standing by the dunes, far enough away that I couldn't really make out his face, but something about him felt off. He wasn't moving, just standing there, staring right at us. Do you guys see that? I asked, my voice shaking just a little. Jess and Leela both turned to look. The guy started walking towards us. I swear, the closer he got, the more I wished we'd never come out here. He towered in a crumpled up button-down shirt and jeans, which at the beach seemed kind of weird. His hair covered his face, but I could see his mouth. He had one of those creepy grins like he was enjoying something that only he knew. The hair tickled my dermis. You girls out for a swim? His voice was rough, as if he hadn't spoken in days. Leela tried to brush it off. We're just going in. He did not move. His eyes kept drifting to Jess, who was still wasted to her waist in the water. Then, he grinned again, bigger, if that was possible. You ought to drop by my camp, he said, nodding to the trees across the dunes. It's over there. It'd be nice to have a drink and get out of the wind. No thanks. Jess snapped, visibly creeped out. He looked at her for a second and chuckled to himself, like he was laughing at the whole thing. You sure? You'd like it. Quiet spot. Good stories. I felt my guts twist. We're leaving. I said, trying to sound confident, and we all started walking back towards the house. I could feel his eyes on us the entire way. That grin was still plastered on his face. We locked the door in the house and tried to shake it off. 
He was probably just some weirdo. Leela said, though none of us believed it. We were all on edge, glancing at the windows now and then, half expecting him to pop up again. We tried to unwind with a movie and wine that night. Big windows that overlooked the beach were beautiful in daylight, but as it got darker outside, they felt like giant black holes. They all could be out there watching. My god, I feel like someone's out there. Jess whispered, darting her eyes towards the windows. I attempted to laugh it off. You're just freaking yourself out. But deep down, I felt it too. It was too quiet, too still. And then, a noise, a thunderous bang from outside, really made us jump. What was that? Leela asked, her voice quivering. Boom, louder than the first, came seemingly from the back of the house. I stood up slowly, beating my heart with my chest. I opened the curtain, blood iced the veins. There was a handprint smeared across the window, as if someone had pressed it there and dragged it down. It was stained red. Oh my god. I whispered, backing up. In time, Jess and Leela ran over, and both of our faces settled perfectly still. That looks bad. Leela said, digging around her for her phone. We should call the cops. And here we all were, packed into the room, looking out the window, waiting for the police. But just before they arrived, we heard something else, some kind of scraping, slow and deliberating, like someone was dragging something along the walls outside the house. The sound was moving, circling the house, getting louder with every pass. By the time the cops arrived, there was nothing to hear. The fella was out of there, and all they had were footprints in the sand and the blood on the window. Cops said probably some local foolishness, but his face told me he didn't believe it. We hardly slept that night. Every little noise made us jump, and every creak of the house seemed to be a threat. Around 3 a.m., I think I heard something, a soft knock on the window, as if someone was tapping on it just barely loud enough to notice. I did not check it. I couldn't. The very next morning, we packed up and left very early. We did not want to be there anymore. Not one of us spoke a word on the way home. It was like we all wanted to forget it ever happened. Three years later, I was scrolling through my phone when something stopped me dead in my tracks. Serial killer arrested in connection to Gilgo Beach murders. I clicked on the article, and there he was, the guy from the beach. The same creepy grin that danced in my head was staring back at me from the mugshot. My heart dropped into my stomach as I realized what could have happened to us that weekend. I quickly sent the article to Leela and Jess, my hands shaking. It was him. I typed, barely able to believe it. He, who was outside our window, tracked us, left his bloody handprint, is a dreaded killer. We narrowly avoided a cruel monster. My name is Mark, and I had only recently started my job as a maintenance worker at a Six Flags amusement park. I was told that the park has its quirks, which become prominent once the rides close, but nothing prepared me for what I encountered during my recent assignment the grand old carousel. The carousel had always been the crown jewel of the park, with its vibrant hand-painted horses and cheerful organ music that echoed throughout the grounds. However, after a recent renovation, something felt off. I'd been tasked with inspecting it after a series of complaints about it malfunctioning, playing distorted music or starting up unexpectedly in the dead of night. It was on a particularly still evening, after the park had closed, when I first heard the music. I had just finished running a series of tests on another ride's motor when the soft, familiar notes of the carousel began to play, floating through the air like a siren's call. The lights flickered on, casting a warm glow, but I knew the power was off. What technical glitch do we have here? Shaking my head as I approached the carousel, I had worked on that ride a bunch of times, yet that night felt off. The horses, with their intricate designs and shimmering paint, stood still beneath the light ominously. I dismissed my unease, attributing it to fatigue, and continued my work. But just when I was down and checking the machines, I suddenly felt someone's hand on my shoulder. 
I let out a yell, but as I turned, I realized that there was no one. That is when the lights and the music went off all of a sudden, and I just scuttled. The following night, I returned to the carousel, heart heavy with a mix of apprehension and curiosity. As I approached, the haunting melody began again, gentler this time, with an almost childlike quality. But something was wrong. One of the horses seemed to be facing me directly, its eyes glimmering with a lifelike quality that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It was different from the others. It looked old and had paint chipping off. All right, this is getting weird. Mark! A voice called from behind me, pulling me from my reverie. It was Lucas, my colleague, stepping into the glow of the carousel's light. You back here again? Yeah, I said, still staring at the horse. You ever notice anything strange about this ride? It's been acting up a lot lately. Lucas chuckled, but there was an edge of uncertainty in his voice. You mean like the urban legend? They say one of the horses is haunted. I shot him a skeptical look. Haunted? Yeah, there's this old story about a special horse. It was modeled after the owner's little girl, who used to visit the park all the time when it opened. Tragic accident took her life nearby, and they say the horse was cursed. Guests complained about it, and since rumors are bad for business, it was removed. Seriously? I'd heard whispers of ghost stories, but I've always dismissed them as folklore. Yeah, people would freak out. Said it was just too lifelike. It must still be in the archives. I wouldn't want to be here alone at night if I were you. He laughed, but it sounded hollow. After Lucas left, I found myself drawn to the archives, digging through old records and photographs of the carousel. Hours later, I stumbled upon an old photo that made my heart race. There it was, the very horse I had seen, its paint chipping off, standing next to a little girl who looked so joyful. A chill washed over me as I read the accompanying notes. The carousel horse, Leela, was destroyed years ago after complaints of strange behavior. I swallowed hard, the realization sinking in. How could this be? Determined to confront the mystery, I returned to the carousel. The park was eerily quiet, and the moment I stepped near, the ride began to spin on its own. The cheerful music now twisted and distorted. The lights flickered violently as well. As the carousel spun faster, my eyes widened in horror. There she was, Leela, the cursed horse, and on its back sat the little girl from the photograph, her eyes locked onto mine, unblinking and eerily calm. Mark. She whispered, her voice barely audible over the chaotic symphony of the carousel. I could feel my heart racing, the cold grip of fear tightening around my throat. The ride's music distorted further, morphing into a chilling lullaby that felt impossibly alive. No, th this can't be real, I shouted, my instincts screaming at me to run. But my legs felt heavy, paralyzed, the girl's eyes boring into my soul. Just as I turned around to escape, I saw the girl before me, her hands stretching out. Join us, Mark. She said, her voice sweet but laced with a chilling undertone. I was looking into her eyes, which were pitch black. Panic surged within me, and in a sudden rush of adrenaline, I tore myself away from the carousel, sprinting through the dark paths of the park. The distorted music echoed behind me, the laughter of the girl twisted into something sinister as I fled. When I returned the next morning, I rushed to the office, but they wouldn't believe what I had seen. Along the way, I ran into Lucas again, but that is when I received the shocker. He said that he had been on a leave for a week and wasn't in the park the previous night. It made me wonder, who did I run into and why did they guide me to the archives? I quit my job then and there. Moving into a new apartment in the city was supposed to be a fresh start. After months of searching, I finally found a place that fit my budget and came with a roommate named Rachel. She was quiet and had her quirks. The first night after unpacking, I took a long shower to wash away the stress. The bathroom was small but clean, with a clawfoot tub and a shower curtain adorned with abstract patterns. 
I closed the curtain fully before stepping in, enjoying the hot water cascading over me. When I finished, I noticed the curtain was slightly ajar. Shrugging it off, I dried myself and headed to bed. In the morning, as I made my way to the kitchen, I noticed wet footprints leading from the bathroom to Rachel's room. They were small, like mine, but I hadn't been in the bathroom since the night before. Hey, Rachel. Did you take a shower last night? She looked up from her cereal, a hint of confusion on her face. No. I went to bed early. Why? I hesitated. No reason. Must have been my imagination. Over the next few days, the unsettling incidents continued. My toothbrush disappeared from its holder, only to reappear in my room, damp and with a strange metallic taste when I used it. One evening, I returned home to find the shower running. Steam billowed from under the bathroom door. Knocking softly, I called out. Rachel? You in there? No response. I opened the door cautiously. The room was empty, the mirror fogged over. Written in the condensation was my name, scrawled repeatedly. My heart pounded. Rachel, this isn't funny. She appeared behind me, startling me. What's wrong? I pointed to the mirror. Did you do this? She glanced at the mirror, her face unreadable. I don't see anything. I blinked, and when I looked back, the writing was gone. Sleep became difficult. Every creak in the apartment set my nerves on edge. One night, a soft whispering pulled me from sleep. I strained to listen. Throwing off the covers, I crept toward the sound. It led me to the bathroom. The door was slightly open, a sliver of light cutting through the darkness. Peering inside, I saw Rachel standing in front of the mirror, her hands tracing circles on its surface. Rachel? She didn't turn. She doesn't see. She doesn't know. A chill ran down my spine. Know what? Her head snapped toward me, eyes wide and lips curled into a grin that didn't reach her eyes. You're up late. I backed away. Couldn't sleep. She stepped closer. You should rest. Big day tomorrow. I fled to my room, locking the door behind me. Determined to uncover what was happening, I decided to search Rachel's room while she was out. Her room was sparse, a neatly made bed, a dresser, and an odd number of mirrors lining the walls. But as I opened her closet, my missing items tumbled out. Clothes, towels, even my hairbrush, all arranged meticulously. At the back of the closet, I found a notebook filled with pages upon pages of handwriting. It was my name, written over and over interspersed with bizarre sketches of faces, some mine, others distorted versions. A floorboard creaked behind me. Looking for something? I spun around, the notebook clutched to my chest. Why do you have my things? She tilted her head, eyes glinting. Borrowed them? You have such good taste. I tried to steady my voice. This isn't normal. You're invading my privacy. She took a step forward. Privacy? We're roommates. We share everything. I edged toward the door. I think I need to find a new place. Her smile faded. You can't leave. Not when we're so close. I didn't wait to hear more. Pushing past her, I ran to my room to grab my phone. As I dialed 911, the line went dead. No signal. Rachel's voice echoed from the hallway. You won't get away that easily. Desperate, I tried the front door, but it was bolted shut. The lock jammed. Panic surged. Rushing back to the bathroom, I thought of escaping through the window. As I entered, something caught my eye. A small red light blinking in the mirror. Leaning in, I realized it wasn't a mirror at all, but a two-way window with a camera embedded behind it. A video feed played on Rachel's tablet, propped discreetly on the counter. It was me, in various states of undress, showering, brushing my teeth, even sleeping. Horror washed over me. What have you done? Rachel stood in the doorway, blocking my exit. I've been documenting us. Our lives together. I glared at her. 
Her features seemed to blur for a moment, shifting subtly to resemble mine. What are you talking about? She stepped closer, her voice eerily calm. I've always admired you, Lisa. Your life, your friends, your smile. I want it all. I realized then that her clothes were mine, fitting her perfectly. Her hair, once brown, now had streaks matching my own blonde highlights. You're insane! She lunged at me, and we grappled, knocking over the table. The screen shattered, and a distorted video played, showing her practicing my mannerisms, mimicking my voice. With a surge of adrenaline, I pushed her away and raced toward the kitchen. Grabbing a knife, I faced her. Stay back! She laughed, a sound devoid of any warmth. You can't hurt me. We're the same now. Sirens wailed in the distance, as I would learn later a neighbor had heard the commotion and called the police. Rachel's expression twisted into rage. You ruined everything! She charged at me, but before she could reach me, the door burst open and officers stormed in. Drop the weapon! I realized they were shouting at me. I dropped the knife, hands raised. Help me! She's trying to steal my identity! They glanced at Rachel, who now stood cowering, tears streaming down her face. I don't know what's happening! She just attacked me! Confusion flooded me. No, she's lying! She's been spying on me! An officer gently restrained me. No! Ask her what happened in Geneva, and then call my mom to confirm. Her smile faded. She made up a story about how a burglar had stolen her purse. But then the cops dialed my mother, who confirmed with the fact that I have never been to Geneva. She was arrested. I had to present my passport as the truth that I had never indeed been there. I don't know why she did that, but I convinced myself that she must have been a psycho to try to become someone else. I was thrilled to start my new job at Whitlock & Associates, a quaint accounting firm nestled in an old brick building downtown. The office had a vintage charm. My desk was by one of those grand windows, and directly across from me sat a woman with long, dark hair that cascaded over her face. She glanced up briefly as I settled in, offering a slight nod before returning to her work. I smiled. Hi, I'm Emma. Nice to meet you. She didn't respond, her pen moving furiously over a notepad. The scratching sound was relentless, almost aggressive. I shrugged it off, assuming she was engrossed in something important. As the morning wore on, I couldn't help but notice her intense focus. Pages filled up rapidly, each one covered in what looked like haphazard scribbles. Curiosity gnawed at me. At one point, I tried to peek at what she was writing but she immediately slapped her hand over the page, eyes still hidden behind her hair. During lunch break, I joined a few colleagues in the break room and caught a smoke with Lily. So, the woman who sits across from me, does she ever join you guys for lunch? She gave me a puzzled look. Who do you mean? The woman with long, dark hair, always writing in her notepad. She chuckled nervously must be one of the auditors from upstairs. They don't gel. Back at my desk, she was still there, pen scratching away. She didn't eat, didn't stretch, didn't even shift in her seat. The pile of filled pages was now spilling onto the floor. You know, it's okay to take a break sometimes. Silence. I returned to my work, but the incessant scratching was maddening. I slipped on my headphones to drown it out. Later, needing a respite, I decided to get some coffee. As I stood up, I glanced at her. She was perfectly still, except for her hand. The way she wrote was almost mechanical, repetitive. In the hallway, I bumped into Mark, one of the IT guys. Hey, do you know if there's a problem with the heating? It's freezing by my desk. Mark raised an eyebrow. I haven't heard any complaints. I'll check the thermostat. Back at my desk, the temperature seemed to have dropped even more. I rubbed my hands together, glancing at the thermostat on the wall. It read a normal 72 degrees. 
The afternoon sun cast reflections on the window behind my colleague. I noticed something odd. Her reflection didn't match her movements. While she wrote feverishly, her reflection sat eerily still, head slowly turning to face me. My breath caught in my throat. I blinked hard. When I looked again, her reflection matched her actions. As the day neared its end, most of the office began to pack up. Hey, we're all heading out soon. Do you need any help with anything? She stopped writing. Slowly, she lifted her head, but her face was still obscured by hair. A whisper reached my ears, so faint I wasn't sure I heard it. They can't see me. A chill ran down my spine. Excuse me? She resumed writing, even more frantically than before. The lights above flickered. I looked around. The rest of the office seemed unaffected. Gathering my belongings, I hurried to leave. As I exited, I glanced back. She was watching me, her face partially visible. Her eyes were dark, sunken, filled with an emotion I couldn't place. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The next day, I arrived to find a sticky note on my monitor. See me in my office, Mr. Thompson. Great. Was I already in trouble? In his office, Mr. Thompson gave me a concerned look. Emma, is everything all right? Some of your colleagues mentioned you seemed distracted. I'm fine. He nodded slowly. Let us know if you need anything. Back at my desk, the woman was absent. Relief washed over me. Maybe she'd taken the day off. Hours passed and she didn't show. As I focused on a particularly tedious spreadsheet, the overhead lights flickered again. The screen glitched, lines of random numbers and symbols replacing my data. Frustrated, I called IT. Mark arrived, frowning at the monitor. That's odd. Looks like some kind of data corruption. As he worked, I noticed a reflection in the darkened part of the screen. Behind me stood the woman, her face inches from mine. I spun around but no one was there. Did you see that? Mark denied. He gave me a sympathetic smile. Take care of yourself, okay? By late afternoon, the office was nearly empty. I decided to investigate. I approached her desk. The notepad was there, covered in frantic handwriting. I hesitated, then picked it up. The pages were filled with a single phrase repeated over and over. They don't see. They don't see. A sudden cold enveloped me. You see me. I whipped around. She stood directly in front of me, hair no longer hiding her face. Her skin was pale, almost translucent, eyes hollow and filled with despair. I was like you. New. Eager. What happened? Tears streamed down her cheeks. They pushed me too hard. You don't see. You don't see. The room darkened. The office lights burst, plunging the room into darkness. I stumbled back, tripping over a chair. When I looked up, she was gone. Emergency lights flickered on. I couldn't move. Days later, after taking time off, I returned to collect my things. I couldn't stay there. As I packed up, I found a small envelope on my desk. Inside was a faded photograph of the woman, smiling, surrounded by people in an office party. On the back, a name was scrawled, Helen Brooks. I approached Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson, what happened to Helen Brooks? He stiffened, eyes narrowing. Where did you hear that name? I showed him the photo. He sighed heavily. <sighs> Helen was an employee here. She left us some time ago. Why did no one mention her? She, uh, she, she jumped from the window where you sit after she was denied a deserved promotion. Different manager then. She kept saying they don't see me. It's, it's not something we discuss. As I left the building, I glanced back at the window by my desk. For a moment, I thought I saw her standing there, watching. Then she faded like a shadow in the sunlight. I never saw her again. Maybe she felt like someone saw her, and she finally found peace. Halloween night was always a bit too much for me. 
Not because of the holiday itself, but the constant doorbell ringing and the throngs of children demanding candy. My five-year-old, Abby, loved it, of course. She'd been buzzing around in her little princess costume since this afternoon, her plastic pumpkin pail swinging on her arm. I, on the other hand, was eight months pregnant, exhausted, and could barely keep up with her. My feet ached from standing at the door, holding out candy to kids who never seemed to stop coming. By 10 p.m., I'd finally put Abby to bed, her pail of candy tucked under her arm like a teddy bear. I'd hoped the constant stream of trick-or-treaters would stop, but they didn't. Not until nearly midnight did the doorbell finally stop ringing. The streets outside were silent now, only a few faint laughs in the occasional car in the distance. I sat down in the living room, candy bowl on my lap, absently munching on the leftovers. Pregnancy cravings had a way of justifying late-night candy binges. I turned on a horror movie, something cheesy and predictable, hoping to relax after the long night. About 15 minutes in, just as I was starting to unwind, there was a knock at the door. I froze, staring at the screen as though the knock had come from inside the movie. Who the hell would be trick-or-treating at this hour? My heart gave a small, reluctant thud as I stood up, shuffling to the door. Through the peephole, I saw him, a man dressed in a werewolf mask, standing silently on the porch. Seriously? I muttered to myself, opening the door just a crack, enough to glare at him. Trick or treat. His voice was low, almost mocking. I squinted at him. My patience was worn thin. Go home, or I'll call the police, stupid pranksters. He didn't move, didn't say anything else, just stood there, staring at me through the cheap plastic mask. I felt a flicker of unease in my gut. There was something wrong about the way he just stood there, the way he watched me. Go away! I snapped, louder now, and slammed the door shut. I waited, listening for his footsteps. Nothing. After a few more seconds of silence, I double-locked the door, flicked off the porch light, and told myself to forget about it. But sleep didn't come easy that night. I tossed and turned. Abby's soft snores from the next room were the only sound in the house. I kept waking up as my mind kept flashing back to the masked man. Who was he? Why was he here? I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. It was around 2 a.m. when I woke with a jolt. My heart pounded as though I'd been running for hours. I couldn't place why. There was no noise, no reason for the sudden feeling of dread that gripped my chest like a vice. I slid out of bed quietly and moved toward the door. Maybe it was just a mother's instinct. Maybe I just needed to check on Abby, make sure she was okay. I padded softly down the hallway. The air in the house was colder than before. As I reached the top of the stairs, I froze. He was there. The man in the werewolf mask crouched on all fours at the bottom of the stairs. His head was tilted at an unnatural angle, staring up at me. His breathing was shallow and raspy, filling the silence of the house. I stood there, unable to move. Only my pulse thudded in my ears. For a moment, neither of us moved. Then, without warning, he let out a low, animalistic growl, like a dog about to pounce. My body reacted before my mind could catch up. I turned and sprinted. I could feel him chasing me, his footsteps heavy and fast, but not like a man running, more like something crawling. I glanced back, and my blood turned to ice. He was coming after me, on all fours, like an animal. His hands and feet scrambled against the stairs, his body twisting unnaturally as he chased me. And the sounds. He was growling, snarling, howling like a wolf. I reached Abby's room just in time, slamming the door shut and locking it. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely dial 911. Please help me. I whispered into the phone. My voice was barely audible over his scratching at the door. There's someone in my house. He's trying to get in. The operator's calm voice tried to reassure me, but it was drowned out by the banging, the scratching, the low, guttural growls coming from the other side of the door. The door shuddered as he kicked it, again and again, harder each time. I was shivering like a leaf as I pressed my back against the door, holding Abby tightly in my arms, praying for the police to arrive. Then, 
Just as the door was about to give way, I heard it, the distant wail of sirens. The banging stopped, the scratching went silent. When the police arrived, they found the front door broken, the lock mangled by what looked like a metal rod, but the man was gone, disappeared into the night like he'd never been there. They searched the house, checked the neighborhood, but there was no trace of him, no clue as to who he was or what he wanted. And I'll never forget the way he looked at me through the mask, the silent, patient stare, like he was waiting, waiting for me to open the door again. I never believed in ghosts. I didn't believe in much of anything, really. So when I was offered the night manager job at the Taco Bell in the small, forgotten town, I didn't pay any attention to the rumors. I was assigned one goal, control the night staff, who seemed to talk about strange happenings at the Taco Bell. The place was built on the site of the old Grand Oaks Hotel, which collapsed 50 years ago, killing dozens during a New Year's Eve party. People whispered that it was haunted, but I figured it was just small town talk. My first night there, the crew was small, just me, Connor, and Lacey. Connor was a scrawny 19-year-old, clearly nervous about working the night shift. Lacey had been there for a few months and seemed tired, like she'd seen enough. Connor kept glancing at me. You know about this place, right? Know what? I asked, barely looking up from my checklist. It's, you know, haunted, he said, lowering his voice like it was some big secret. Haunted? Seriously? I shook my head. Come on, man, you don't actually believe that stuff. He swallowed. People see things, hear things, especially at night. I shrugged. It's an old building, that's all. The wind creaks, the pipes knock, and people start imagining things. Lacey mumbled, almost too low to hear. It's more than that. Before I could ask what she meant, the headset crackled. Static at first, but then I heard something beneath it. A whisper. I glanced at the cameras. No cars in the drive through Nobody near the speaker. Probably interference, I said, though even I didn't sound convinced. Connor paled. That's how it starts. I frowned. What? The whispers. It always starts with the whispers. Then... The smoke. I snorted. Smoke? Really? But as soon as I said it, I smelled it. Faint but unmistakable, like burnt wood or cigarettes. I walked around checking the equipment. Everything was off. Nothing malfunctioning. The building's just old, I said, trying to ignore the uneasy feeling creeping into my gut. Let's get back to work. That night dragged on. The drive-thru stayed empty. The dining area was quiet, and I could tell Connor and Lacey were jumpy. Around midnight, I noticed the security cameras flicker. I leaned in, watching the screen. First, they went grainy. Then, some flies arrived particularly close to the camera. Then... As crazy as it sounds, the flies formed a face, distorted, stretched, almost unrecognizable. It was gone in a flash. Connor saw my reaction. You saw it, didn't you? I saw an old granny once. I shook my head. It's just a glitch. Lacey's voice was barely above a whisper. It's them. I sighed. (sighs) Who? The people who died here. She said, not even looking at me. Enough, I snapped. We're not doing this. No more ghost stories. Let's finish up. That is when suddenly I heard sounds, like someone was running back in the kitchen. I paused and listened carefully. There were just the three of us, and no customers. The two just stood paralyzed, clearly hearing the same sound too. Are you guys playing some tricks to scare the new managers away? They did not respond, so I went ahead towards the sounds of someone running. They usually don't like to be disturbed when the kids are... playing. I paused. They were trying to rattle me, and somehow I felt that I couldn't let them succeed. If somehow I left this job, I wouldn't find another for months. I just couldn't. Just leave them. They can get violent if bothered during their kitchen time. You know what? 
you come with me. And Connor, you too. They exchanged glances before carefully coming after me as we went inside. Suddenly, the sound stopped. I turned all the lights on, but there was nobody. I couldn't understand how they were doing it, but there was no one who was running in the kitchen. That is when suddenly the fryer malfunctioned. Oil started pouring out, catching a small fire. Connor screamed from the back, and I rushed in with a fire extinguisher to help. We barely got it under control, but that is when the smell of smoke filled the kitchen. But it wasn't from the fire. It was like the smell of rotten flesh mixed with smoke. I was too stunned to know how to respond. They couldn't have done this, but my rational mind still couldn't fathom what was happening. But that is when the boxes started falling. Heavy ones, stacking too high to fall on their own, but swiftly moving across like an invisible force was pulling them. They nearly hit Connor twice, and I knew it wasn't just bad luck. We ran out and closed the door behind. Suddenly, all the sounds stopped, except for the running of footsteps. Connor picked his bag and left immediately. Lacey's feelings were mutual. I have seen some sick things here, but never that. This isn't just some haunting. They are trying to kill us, and I am done. I had to pay my grandma's bills, so I stuck for so long. But I'm not paid enough for this shit. Lacey left as well, handing me the keys and quitting. I took a few minutes to come out of my shock. I still had to lock the place. But as it dawned on me how alone I was at this place, the power went out. No backup lights. Nothing. The whole place was plunged into darkness. I grabbed my phone. No signal. I reached for the emergency flashlight, but it flickered weakly, barely casting any light. As I turned, through the flickering of the lights, I saw them. Figures, pale and faded, drifting through, now outside the kitchen as well. They were dressed in old clothes, like from the 1920s. There was a woman in a gown, her face twisted backwards. Her eyes met mine, hollow and empty. She reached out with a trembling hand, her fingers too long, her mouth moving but making no sound. My heart pounded. Then, a child started moving towards me as well, wailing. Then, an old man. Soon, they were all drawn to me. I backed up, ran for the door, but it wouldn't budge. I was trapped. Panicking, I grabbed a chair and threw it at the nearest window. The glass shattered, and I scrambled through, cutting my arms on the way out. I didn't stop running until I my legs gave up. I was sick in bed for the next five days, and then I quit. Every Halloween, our street turned into a blur of costumes, laughter, and flashing porch lights. Kids ran from door to door, their candy bags growing heavier by the minute. I loved it. The excitement, the sugar rush, the feeling that we were part of something magical, if only for one night. But there was always one house at the end of the block that no one went near. The old McFadden house. Even during the day, it gave off a creepy vibe. Its paint had long since peeled away, leaving rotten wood exposed. The front yard was overgrown, and no one had seen the McFaddens in years. Some said they'd moved away. Others claimed they were still inside, hiding. The kids had a different theory, that the house swallowed the children whole. My friends and I made a game out of telling stories about the place. Each Halloween, we dared each other to knock on that door. No one ever did, of course, until that year. I was 12, full of bravado, and hopped up on too much candy. My best friend Darren double dared me, and in a moment of adrenaline-fueled stupidity, I took the challenge. I'm gonna do it. They laughed, but I could see a flicker of something else in their eyes. Fear, maybe adoration. Either way, I couldn't back down. As I walked toward the McFadden house, the sounds of the neighborhood seemed to fade. The laughter and music from the other homes became muffled, like I was slipping out of reality and into something darker. The door looked worse up close, splintered and warped, as if something had tried to claw its way out. I reached for the rusted doorknob, and to my surprise, it turned easily. The door creaked open, revealing a long, narrow hallway bathed in dim yellow light. I hesitated. The air inside was thick, 
stale. Dust motes floated in the weak light, like the house hadn't been disturbed in years. But I'd already come this far. I stepped inside. It didn't look like the house of some crazy old couple. In fact, it looked like someone had been expecting me. There were Halloween decorations, cheap plastic spiders and fake webs hanging from the ceiling. A row of jack-o'-lanterns lined the hallway, their carved faces twisted into sinister grins. But what struck me most were the photographs. They lined the walls, old black and white pictures of kids in Halloween costumes. Some of them looked happy, too happy. Others, there was something wrong with their eyes, hollow, almost vacant. I moved closer, squinting at the nearest photo. The boy was about my age, grinning from ear to ear, but his eyes were dead, and to my horror, I recognized him. No way. It was Tommy Hartwell, the kid who disappeared last Halloween. We'd all heard the stories, but everyone figured he'd just been kidnapped. I stared at the picture, a knot forming in my stomach. That couldn't be right. Tommy was gone. But how could he be here? smiling in a photo that looked decades old. I heard it then, the sound of soft laughter. It echoed from somewhere deeper inside the house, the kind of giggle that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I took a step back, but the door behind me slammed shut with a bang that shook the walls. My heart pounded. I was trapped. I backed away from the door, and as I did, a cold breeze swept through the hallway, flickering the jack-o'-lantern's candles. The shadows stretched, growing long and distorted, and from the corner of my eye, I saw something move. Who's there? There was no response, just more of that eerie, distant <laughs> laughter. Then, out of the darkness, a figure emerged. It was Tommy, his clothes torn and dirty, his face twisted, but it wasn't the Tommy I remembered. His skin was pale, almost gray, and his eyes, they were empty empty black pits staring right through me. Tom? He didn't respond. Instead, he raised a hand and pointed at the far end of the hallway. His voice came out as a rasp, heavy. You have to help us! I was frozen. Us? I looked around, and suddenly the faces in the photo seemed to be watching me. The hollow eyes followed my every move. Tommy stepped closer. If you don't help... You'll become us? Like you? Tommy nodded, his face contorted with pain. The walls around me seemed to close in. What do I have to do? He pointed at the door at the end of the hallway. It looked just like the one I'd come through, but this one had something carved into it. My name. No. I didn't want to go in. Every instinct screamed at me to turn back, to find another way out. But the look in Tommy's eyes, those dark, empty eyes, told me there was no choice. I reached for the doorknob, my hand shaking. As I turned it, the door creaked open, revealing a narrow, dark staircase. I stepped through and the house seemed to sigh. The light behind me disappeared, swallowed by the darkness. I kept walking and walking, and then I was back outside. The house was silent, its windows dark and lifeless. I ran back to my home and told my parents everything. I was shivering, but they just thought I was spooked by Halloween. But the next morning, the street woke to sirens. The McFadden house was ablaze, engulfed in fires reaching five stories high. That is when I saw the look in my parents' eyes, unable to believe, but knowing in their heart that I spoke the truth. The kids who had disappeared over the years, they were never found. And to this day, every Halloween, I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't opened that door. Working the late shift at Taco Bell isn't generally exciting. Still, nothing could have prepared us for what would happen on that Tuesday evening. It began like every other night, quiet, with a few patrons meandering in at their own pace orders as monotonous as the menu itself. I was working the register, taking orders while keeping an eye on the clock, ticking down the hours to the end of my shift. It was around 10 p.m. when the doors swung open and three rowdy teenagers came rushing in, laughing and pushing each other as they threaded their way to the counter. 
They were boisterous, almost to the point of being obnoxious, but harmless. They filed behind an older woman who seemed transfixed by her phone. The line crept forward, and the boys became restless. One of them, a tall kid with a shock of blue hair, brushed past the woman, making his way to the front. Hey, no cutting. She snapped, looking up from her screen, her eyes narrowing. The boy shrugged, clearly unbothered. Chill, lady, we're just trying to get some food. The tension was immediate and seemed to thicken the air. I stood there frozen, still over the register, unsure what to do next. You have to wait in line like everyone else. The woman continued, moving closer to the boy. Her voice came with a hard edge that made you stand up just a little straighter. The teenager rolled his eyes. However, before he could utter a word, his pals followed suit. They formed a small blockade for the woman in the counter, smirking along with the accusing group. That is when things went from bad to worse. The female pulled out her purse and with one swift motion produced a pepper spray canister. I barely had a moment to process what was happening as the woman sprayed it directly into the face of the blue-haired boy. Chaos broke out. The boy screamed and clutched at his eyes as his friends stumbled backward, coughing and gagging as the spray hit them too. The woman continued spraying, her face a mask of rage, without stopping until the canister was empty. Security! Somebody call the police! I shouted, finally breaking out of my trance. I dialed 911, my fingers shaking as they pushed the buttons on my phone. Across from me, people started screaming, while others ran out of the door and the rest stood filming on their phones. She didn't let it end there. She started to scream at the boys, mashing together curses and accusations. The manager, Tony, a massive guy that has been hiding from everyone in the back, rushed out to try and somewhat put a damper on this situation. Ma'am, you need to leave, now! Tony barked, positioning himself between her and the horde of teenagers she so viciously attacked. But she was long gone with reason. They deserve it. They can just do whatever they want. I know my rights, and if you come any closer, I'll spray you too. She screamed, her face flushed with rage, her hands still on the can, ready to spray. Within minutes, the police arrived, arriving not in the least to calm the mayhem. They cuffed the woman, reading her rights as she continues screaming. The teenagers were taken outside, paramedics attending to their burning eyes and reddened skin. I stand in my store, at the back of the counter. My mind is racing, trying to keep up with what had just gone on. The smell of pepper spray hangs heavily in the air, leaving a burning ache and itching eyes. I couldn't help but imagine the female face raging in fury, or the cries from the boy. They took all of them in, and I spoke my account as clearly as possible, my voice shaking. They told us that the woman was going to be charged with felony assault. It was still so much like a fantasy that an innocent misunderstanding over cutting in line would suddenly take this violent turn. Just after I walked out as my shift ended, it was cool outside, from all the heated activity inside, but how quickly things spiraled out of control, impatience to an extreme reaction. The incident stayed with me way after that night, sort of being a grim reminder of how unpredictable people could be. Working at Taco Bell wasn't ever the same. Every customer walking through the door was a potential threat, every shift a test of my ability to stay calm in the face of the unexpected. And then, over the following weeks, the tail of the pepper spraying begins to spread, transforming our quiet Taco Bell into an institution in the community. Strangers began to enter, hoping to glimpse some evidence of the drama that did in fact occur there talking to each other in hushed tones as they wait in line. And I sit there, contemplating whether any of them carried a canister of pepper spray in their bags, just waiting for an excuse to unleash mayhem. I had always cherished the rare moments when our family could escape the bustle of daily life. 
So when I heard about the historic Venetian villa that had been converted to an Airbnb, which was available for a weekend stay at eye-watering prices, it seemed like the perfect retreat. The villa, though aged, possessed a certain charm with its faded frescoes and ivy-clad walls whispering secrets of bygone eras. My husband, our three children, and I arrived on a crisp autumn afternoon, the setting sun casting golden hues over the ancient stone. I found it odd that there wasn't much staff, nor was the villa in a pristine condition. A property manager showed us around, then handed the keys. As we settled in, the children darted through the grand hallways, their laughter echoing off marble floors. I followed them into a dimly lit parlor, where a grand piano stood in solitary grandeur. Its ebony surface bore the scars of time. Scratches marred its once lustrous finish, and several keys were chipped or missing. Drawn to it, I couldn't resist running my fingers over the ivory keys. I was a music teacher myself who had a dream of one day becoming a maestro, but life had other plans. Despite its disrepair, I coaxed a few soft notes that echoed eerily through the silent halls. That evening, as we gathered for dinner, an unusual hush fell over the children. They picked at their food, eyes distant. Are you feeling all right? I asked, but they merely nodded. Later, as I tucked them into bed, I heard them humming unfamiliar melodies in their sleep, complex compositions far beyond their years. A shiver ran down my spine, but I dismissed it as remnants of the day's excitement. The next day, my husband grew uncharacteristically distant. He sat by the window, tapping his fingers rhythmically on the sill as if playing an invisible instrument. What tune is that? I inquired gently. He glanced at me with a vacant stare. Just something stuck in my head, he murmured before turning back to the window. The villa's previous owner was a brilliant but tormented composer named Alessandro Verdi, obsessed with creating the perfect symphony to bridge the mortal world and the afterlife. His fixation led to madness. He died in that mansion, his magnum opus unfinished. Suddenly, I heard the piano, but as I rushed to the room, There was no one. That night, a storm raged outside. The villa seemed to come alive with the music. I woke up to find my husband missing. Then, I ventured into my kids' room, and they were gone as well. I rushed to the hall in panic, but there I found them swaying like sleepwalkers, eyes glazed, each drawn to different walls while the piano played its music. Panic gripped me as I called out to them, but they remained unresponsive. Desperate and terrified, I ran through the winding hallways hoping to find a help, but my own shadow seemed to outrun me and then move on its own. Doors slammed shut behind me, and the air grew thick with the scent of old parchment and candle wax. I stumbled back into the parlor where the grand piano stood. To my astonishment, the room was transformed. The piano appeared restored. That is when the realization struck me. Verdi's spirit was in turmoil, his magnum opus unfinished. Music might be the key to appeasing him. With trembling hands, I sat at the piano, drawing upon my own skills and the haunting memories my children had hummed. I began to weave together the fragments of the unfinished symphony. The notes flowed seamlessly, guided by a force beyond my understanding. The music swelled, filling the villa with a hauntingly beautiful composition that resonated with sorrow and longing. As I played the final chord, a profound silence enveloped the villa. The oppressive atmosphere lifted, and the shadows receded into the walls. My husband and children blinked, finally waking up, confusion clouding their faces. What happened? My husband asked, his eyes searching mine. I think it's over. I whispered, relief washing over me. The restored piano faded back into its dilapidated state. The air was clear and still, the storm outside calming to a gentle rain. The next morning, we hastily packed our belongings, eager to leave the villa behind. As we loaded the car, I glanced back one last time. For a fleeting moment, I think I saw a figure standing at an upper window, a man with a gentle smile. Then, he faded away, leaving only the ancient stone facade. I never imagined inheriting anything from Aunt Clara. She was the black sheep of the family, mysterious, reclusive, and whispered about it in hushed tones at family gatherings. 
When I learned she had left me her beach house, where she was found dead, I was conflicted. Let's make an adventure out of it, my boyfriend Alex had suggested. With his tussled blonde hair and infectious grin, he could make any situation feel safe. So, we packed up his old jeep and headed to the coast. As we pulled up to the house, a chill ran down my spine. The once grand Victorian stood weathered and decaying, its paint peeling like dead skin. The ocean roared behind it, waves crashing against jagged rocks. It's giving more haunted house than beach house. It's just old. Let's find out what we can make of it. We stepped inside, greeted by a musty scent and dust particles dancing in the stale air. The floors creaked underfoot, and faded portraits lined the walls, stern ancestors whose eyes seemed to follow us. While exploring, we stumbled upon a door hidden behind a heavy bookshelf. We heaved the shelf aside, revealing a narrow staircase descending into darkness. Should we go down? We came for an adventure, right? Armed with flashlights, we descended into the basement. Strange symbols were etched into the stone walls, circles, stars, and unfamiliar runes. At the center stood an altar draped in crimson cloth, adorned with candles, bones, and a locket I recognized as Aunt Clara's. What was she into? Alex picked up a worn book from the altar. Looks like some kind of journal. That night, sleep eluded me. When I finally drifted off, vivid nightmares consumed me. I saw Aunt Clara, her long silver hair flowing as she chanted in a language that grated against my ears. Shadowy figures danced around a fire, and the symbols from the basement glowed ominously. I jolted awake, heart pounding. The room was cold, and the curtains fluttered, despite the windows being closed. Over the next days, the unease grew. Objects didn't stay where we left them. The old radio turned on by itself, playing static laden tunes from decades past. Alex seemed distant. Are you feeling okay? Just tired. This place is giving me the creeps. Should we leave? No. I spoke with a contractor. He'll come and help us estimate the costs of renovation. He snapped more than usual, his patience wearing thin over trivial matters. Determined to uncover the truth, I delved into Aunt Clara's journal. Her neat handwriting detailed her involvement with a group seeking eternal life through soul transference. She believed she could cheat death. The final entry chilled me to the bone. The vessel must be of my bloodline or one bound by love to it. The ritual nears completion. That is when a floorboard creaked behind me. What are you reading? His voice was flat, devoid of emotion. Just some of Aunt Clara's writings. She was... disturbed. He stepped closer, shadows casting his face in darkness. Maybe you should leave it alone. That night, the nightmares intensified. I saw Alex standing beside Aunt Clara, both chanting as they advanced toward me. I awoke to find him gone from bed. Panic set in. Alex, where are you? I found him in the basement, standing before the altar, the symbols on the walls pulsating with a faint glow. Alex, what are you doing? He turned slowly, a sinister smile creeping across his face. She chose me, Nadia. It's an honor. I backed away, fear gripping me. You're scaring me. Let's go back upstairs. He advanced towards me. Don't you see? She promised me eternity. I dashed up the stairs, slamming the door behind me. My mind raced. I had to do something. The journal suddenly made sense. I frantically searched for a way to reverse the ritual. Pages stuck together until I found a passage about breaking the connection. The ritual must have an anchor. Destroying the anchor would sever the connection. The locket on the altar. It it had to be the anchor. Gathering my courage, I headed back to the basement. But surprisingly, Alex was nowhere in sight. I grabbed the locket, its metal cold against my skin. That is when Alex's heavy voice echoed from the stairs. You can't stop us! Carefully, I looked up, only to realize that he was sticking like a lizard to the ceiling of the basement. I screamed in fear and he lunged at me, but I dodged, racing up the stairs and out onto the beach. 
The moon cast an eerie glow on the restless sea. I could hear footsteps behind me. Leave me alone! He caught up, grabbing my wrist with an iron grip. It's too late. She will live again. Desperate, I yanked free and accidentally hurled the locket into the ocean. A piercing Whoa! scream suddenly filled the air, not just from Alex, but layered with Aunt Clara's voice. He collapsed onto the sand, convulsing. I knelt beside him as his breathing steadied, his eyes fluttering open. Relief washed over me. We left the beach house that very night, the first rays of dawn breaking as we drove away. We never returned there. I put it up for sale and decided to move on. I always loved Halloween. The costumes, the escape from reality, the thrill of being someone else for a night. So when my friend Alyssa invited me to an exclusive pirate-themed Halloween party on a private Hawaiian island, I couldn't resist. It was hosted by a wealthy entrepreneur she knew through her job at a luxury travel agency. We arrived at the island just before sunset. The sky was pink, casting a magical glow over the palm trees and pristine beach. A grand ship replica was anchored near the shore, serving as a backdrop for the festivities. Lanterns hung from the trees, and the sound of waves mingled with the distant music. This is incredible. My costume, a slutty pirate captain with a crimson coat and knee-high boots, matched Alyssa's ensemble. As we made our way to the main area, I noticed guests arriving in elaborate costumes, some more authentic than others. The attention to detail was impressive. Servers dressed as deckhands offered exotic drinks, and the atmosphere buzzed with excitement. We were all given a glowing jelly-like sweet. We joined the crowd, mingling and enjoying. Yet, despite the lively scene, I felt a slight unease. Perhaps it was the way the stuff seemed overly attentive, their eyes lingering a bit too long, or the subtle way security personnel were stationed at every exit. Did you notice the security here? I asked Alyssa. It's a high-profile event with wealthy guests. Makes sense they'd be cautious. I nodded, trying to shake off the feeling. We continued to enjoy the party, dancing and laughing under the starlit sky. Later in the evening, I decided to step away to get some fresh air. Walking toward the quieter side of the beach, I spotted a small group of guests talking in hushed tones. I heard they're planning to move them tonight. Are you sure? The schedule was for tomorrow. Change of plans. The boss doesn't want any delays. I frowned, unsure of what I was hearing. Emma? A voice behind me nearly made me jump out of my skin. I turned to see a man dressed as a ship's officer, his expression unreadable. The main event is about to start. You're invited to join us, he said, his tone polite but firm. Uh, sure. He guided me back to the main area, where Alyssa was waiting. There you are. They're about to start the treasure hunt. We were handed old-fashioned maps and split into teams. The objective was to find hidden clues leading to a grand prize. It seemed like fun, but the conversation I'd overheard nagged at me. As our group ventured into the dense foliage, the path became less defined. Does this seem off to you? I whispered to Alyssa. You're overthinking. It's part of the adventure. We reached a clearing where an old chest sat under a large tree. One of the team members eagerly opened it, revealing a note inside of treasure. Return to the ship for the final challenge, it read. Confused, we began to make our way back, but the path we'd taken was no longer there. The trees seemed denser, the way obscured. That's odd. I could have sworn we came this way. Our phones had no signal. Suddenly, someone shouted. We turned to see figures emerging from the trees, dressed not in costumes, but in plain black attire, faces obscured by masks. Before we could react, the masked figures surrounded us. One stepped forward. Please remain calm. We require your cooperation. Who are you? What do you want? Your families have resources. They'll pay handsomely for your safe return. Kidnapping. The word hit me like a blow. This was a setup. 
Alyssa grabbed my hand. We bolted into the jungle, the sound of footsteps pursuing us. Adrenaline surged as we dodged trees and leapt over roots. I spotted a narrow path leading toward the beach. We burst through the foliage onto the sand, the ocean stretching out before us. In the distance, the replica ship loomed. An idea sparked. The ship? They might have a radio or something we can use to call for help. We sprinted toward it, climbing the gangplank as quickly as our shaking legs allowed. The deck was eerily quiet, devoid of the earlier merriment. Check the captain's quarters. Alyssa urged. We found the room and frantically searched for any communication equipment. Instead, we discovered files containing information about us, photos, background details, family connections. They've been planning this. Alyssa whispered, terror in her eyes. Footsteps echoed on the deck outside. We hid behind a large cabinet as the door creaked open. Men entered and ransacked the room. That is when I noticed a flare gun mounted on the wall. I pointed to it, and Alyssa nodded. Carefully, I reached for it, praying the shadows concealed our movement. Just as one of the men approached, I stood up and fired the flare at him. He stumbled backward into his accomplices. Run! We dashed out of the room, chaos erupting behind us. On deck, other guests were being herded together, confusion and fear evident on their faces. I fired another flare into the air in order to distract them. Alyssa pointed to a lifeboat. We hurried to lower it, but the mechanism was slow. The kidnappers were closing in. With a final push, the lifeboat hit the water. We jumped in and began rowing with all our strength. After a while, we spotted a Coast Guard vessel responding to the flare. Relief washed over me as the kidnappers retreated. Hours later, we woke up in a hospital, but our world had changed. They told us that we were rescued by fishermen, that the replica was an old shipwreck that belonged to pirates in the 17th century. There was evidence of a small private party at the island, but when the authorities investigated, they didn't find anyone else there. They also found a high quantity of drugs in our system, and I suspected it had to do with the glowing jelly that we were offered. We never understood how much of it was real or how much we had hallucinated. But the fact remained that none of the other guests were ever seen again. It was going to be the greatest summer yet. Rachel and I, along with friends, had been planning this trip to Six Flags for months, looking forward to a day filled with roller coasters, carnival games, and overpriced snacks. The sun was bright when we entered the park, and the air was alive with the excited screams of thrill seekers. Rachel was always up for an adventure, encouraging everyone to try the most terrifying rides in the park. Nothing today would change this pattern. Today, she had set her target on the Cyclone, this newest, most extreme roller coaster in the park. Standing out as the tallest ride above the park, its twisted tracks seemed to be warping with the laws of physics. Come on, guys. It's going to be epic. Rachel shouted, her eyes sparkling with excitement. Me? I'm not a fan of heights, but I didn't want to appear to be a coward. Yeah, sure, let's do it. I mumbled, trying to sound like I was enthusiastic. We waited in line, the slow pace only picking up as we all edged closer to the ride. Rachel couldn't help but notice an old man near the entrance. He was weathered in face and eyes, filled with the weird mix of sadness and a warning. He caught Rachel's eye, shaking his head slowly as he mouthed words that she couldn't hear. Did you see that guy? She whispered to me. He looked... strange. I shrugged. Just probably one of those theme park weirdos. Don't let it get to you. We inched closer to the front of the line. We buckled ourselves in. The safety bar snapped into place as we settled in. The operator gave us the thumbs up and the coaster lurched forward, starting up a slow climb to the top. The anticipation built with each clank of the chain lift. As we crested the summit, the park stretched out below us, and for an instant, all was silent. Then, with a jolt, the coaster hurled down and the wind whipping past us as we screamed in exhilaration and terror. The twisting curves came fast and furious, G-forces pinning us to our seats. Halfway down, something seemed off. The coaster rattled, and my heart stopped. 
The ride was breaking down. Panic flooded the operator's face as he frantically pressed buttons, hoping to regain control. Rachel, what's happening? I yelled over the din of the ride. I don't know. Hold on. Rachel was yelling back as she gripped the safety bar until her knuckles were white. Again, the coaster jolted, and I could feel my restraints loosening. Fear was racing my mind. This wasn't supposed to happen. We were supposed to be safe. Jarring, the ride came to an abrupt dead stop, and we hung precautiously at an angle. Sounds of mechanical failure echoed from all sides and through loudspeakers, the voice of the operator crackling and remaining as calm as possible. Please remain calm. There are technical problems. Emergency services are on their way. My heart kept pounding in my chest. The roller coaster ride was no longer a thrilling experience. It had turned into a nightmare. I could hear my friends whispering in fear, and a feeling of realization of vulnerability hit us. We sat there waiting for rescue, minutes looking like hours. Then, the rotor sound of a helicopter and a few figures climbing up the structure. A first responder reached us, his face hidden under a helmet as he set up each rider in a harness. They got us out of there without any further problems. Rachel and I were last. As we were lowered from the awning, relief washed over us, except that something felt off. The park was deathly silent. The usual cacophony of noise had been replaced by concerned murmurs and flashing lights of rescue vehicles. As we were being dragged away, I could feel I was seeing that old man sitting in a corner there. He had his voice to various officials while speaking with them, voicing some murmured words, and his face looked grave. I felt the old man must have known something we did not. Later, coming together to our friends, we felt a park official caught hold of us. We're sorry for the scare. The ride had malfunctioned due to a technical error. We're conducting a full investigation. Rachel nodded, still dazed. Thanks. We're just glad we're safe. As I left the park, I heard two maintenance guys. It's the same problem from last month. They should have shut it down then. My blood ran cold. We nearly became victims of negligence. I looked at Rachel and my voice quivered. We should report this. They knew it was dangerous. Rachel nodded gravely to the responsibility. Let's make sure nothing like this happens again. Our exciting day turned into a close call, but still, we learned that no one else would go through such danger. The twist in our adventure was not just the malfunction, but also the way that our lives had been gambled for profit. A week later, Rachel and I were sitting in a dingy, dismal room. There was the park's attorney and an insurance investigator for one. They were trying to have us tell them everything about the incident. The air was tense as we described what happened. We understand your concern said the attorney lastly. However, there is something you need to know. Rachel and I stared at each other in bewilderment. What is it? I asked. The lawyer took a lungful of air. The cyclone was to have been demolished months ago. The thing is unsafe, he said. It had been inspected multiple times and declared unsafe. However, the management reinstated the order due to its budgetary constraint. Rachel's mouth opened in shock. You mean that they were well aware it was unsafe, but they continued running it? The attorney nodded. Yes, but worse. We found that the ride was intentionally designed to fail. I felt a wave of cold shock. What? Why anyone's going to do that? The investigator advanced. Well, we think it is some sort of insurance fraud attempt. The management had good hopes to collect a big amount from its insurance policy due to an accident. Rachel's face paled to a whitish color. So we were just a pawn in their game? The lawyer nodded grimly. Unfortunately so. But thanks to your testimonies and the evidence, the perpetrators will be brought to justice. Rachel and I walked out of the office, dazed. Six Flags was the destination, a day of rides, thrills, and fun. And after all, into the clutches of greedy corporate individuals. Walking away from the park, I turned around one last time, my adrenaline now replaced by a sense of resolve in me. We had just ridden out of the cyclone, but the real roller coaster was just starting to go. My heart skipped a beat when I matched with Adam. His profile showed a charming smile, dark hair, and a hint of mystery. 
He mentioned he was new in town and looking to make connections. We hit it off immediately, sharing jokes and stories late into the night. By the way... I messaged. My uncle throws this incredible Halloween party every year. You should come. Adam replied. Sounds fun. I'll be the guy in the classic sailor costume. White uniform, navy accents, and a simple black mask. Can't wait to meet you in person. It seemed odd to me how he was already ready with a costume, but since Halloween was approaching, I didn't think much of it. The night of the party arrived, and my uncle's old house was alive with music and laughter. My uncle's place was always the highlight of the season, decked out in elaborate decorations that transformed it into a haunted mansion. I wore a flapper dress, complete with feathers and pearls, feeling like I'd stepped back into 1920s. As I mingled with friends, I spotted Adam across the room. The sailor costume suited him perfectly, and the black mask added an air of intrigue. He approached with a confident smile. Julia, I presume? Guilty as charged. Glad you could make it. We clicked instantly. He had a way of making me feel like we were the only two people in the crowded room. We danced to the upbeat music, and as we moved, he leaned in. You know, I could totally see you dressing up like a princess and dancing through these halls. I actually did that. Uncle's Halloween parties are always amazing. I couldn't see him. Else I would have introduced you. He smiled mysteriously. You seem like someone who grew up with grand traditions. I giggled like a teen. Later, as the party buzzed around us, he suggested we find a quieter spot. He led me to my uncle's old study, a room filled with antique furniture and family heirlooms. The scent of aged books and polished wood surrounded us. I hadn't been in there for years. Adam picked up a vintage photograph from the mantelpiece. Is this you? I peered at the picture. It was me as a child sitting on the porch of this very house. It is. I didn't realize my uncle still had this out. Also, great eye. (laughs) You've hardly changed. I was a child. You're still to me. What? Nothing. He nodded, his eyes unreadable behind the mask, hiding a pretty face which I was craving to see. He locked his eyes with me, put a hand on my back, and pulled me in, leaning to give a kiss. I moved back and decided to change the subject. I should probably get back to my friends. As we rejoined the party, I reached for my phone to check the time, but it was missing from my purse. That's odd. I murmured. Everything okay? My phone's gone. I must have left it somewhere. He reached into his pocket and handed it to me. Found this on your uncle's table. I took it slowly. Oh, thanks. Never realized I took it out. But doubt lingered. I excused myself. Maybe I just need something to drink. Adam handed me a glass from a nearby table, not letting me go. Here, try this. I hesitated. What is it? Just punch. Promise it'll make you feel better. I sipped cautiously. The room felt warmer, the lights a bit too bright. Adam stayed close, his hands lightly touching my elbows. You seem tense. I'm fine. I insisted, even though I wasn't sure. As the evening wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. His voice, his mannerisms, they all seemed strangely familiar. I tried to recall if we'd met before, but my thoughts were muddled. Needing a moment alone, I slipped away to find the bathroom. On my way, I noticed a door ajar leading into a small storage room. Drawn by curiosity, I stepped inside. Stacked on shelves were boxes labeled with family names. One box in particular caught my eye. It had my mother's name on it. I opened it to find old photographs and letters. Among them was a picture that made my blood run cold. It was my uncle at a past Halloween party, wearing the exact sailor costume Adam had on. The white uniform, navy accents, and black mask. I stumbled back, memories flooding in. The way Adam knew about my childhood, the familiar gestures, his presence in the study surrounded by family mementos. Heart pounding, I rushed back to the party. I searched the crowd frantically but couldn't find him. Spotting my parents, I hurried over. Mom, Dad, I need to talk to you. They looked concerned. What is it, honey? 
I told them everything. Their faces paled. My father clenched his jaw. Are you sure? I nodded. He knew things. Personal things. And the costume. It's his. Without another word, my father went to call the police while my mother stayed by my side. Minutes later, officers arrived, discreetly making their way through the guests. They found my uncle in the garage doing drugs and escorted him out, his mask removed to reveal a smug expression. As he passed me, he gave a sly smile. I just wanted to dance with you, Julia, baby. I'll return for that kiss. A chill settled over me. My mother hugged me tightly. The realization that someone I trusted had crossed such a line left me feeling exposed and vulnerable. In the days that followed, I tried to make sense of it all. How long had he been watching me? Why would he do this? One thing was certain. The masks people wear aren't always part of a costume. Sometimes, they're there to hide the darkest intentions. It was 20 years ago when I spent a summer at my grandparents' home in rural Wyoming. Their house sat near a serene lake, its water so calm that they mirrored the sky perfectly. As a city kid, the vast open spaces and the quiet nights were both exhilarating and a bit unsettling. Soon after my arrival, I made friends with some local kids around my age. There was Tom, with his mischievous grin, and Lisa, who was always up for an adventure. One afternoon, they introduced me to a peculiar game they'd invented. It involved one kid sitting on a plastic chair by the lake while another slapped the chair's back with a dusty cloth, building up static electricity. When someone touched the kid in the chair, a sharp jolt would spark, sending us all into fits of laughter. Eager to fit in, I took my turn on the chair. As Tom vigorously slapped the cloth against the seat, I felt the static beneath me build. Lisa reached out and tapped my arm, but instead of the quick shock I expected, a surge of energy coursed through me, and my vision blurred. Colors intensified, and the world around me took on a surreal, almost dreamlike quality. I blinked rapidly, trying to steady myself. That's when I saw them. Figures around the lake's edge that hadn't been there before. Men and women dressed in old-fashioned clothing, their faces pale and eyes distant. Some stood motionless, gazing across the water, while others walked slowly along the shore. The vision lasted only a few seconds before fading away, leaving me disoriented. Did you guys see that? I asked, my voice shaky. See what? Tom replied, exchanging a puzzled look with Lisa. The people by the lake, I insisted. They were right there. <laughs> I think the static got to your head, Jack. Embarrassed, I dropped the subject. But later, as we parted ways, a quiet boy named Ethan approached me. He'd been on the outskirts of our group, rarely speaking. I believe you, he said softly. You do? Relief washed over me. I've seen them too. They're not real. Not, not like us. They're spirits. Spirits? I echoed, skeptical yet intrigued. Ethan glanced around to ensure we were alone. Meet me here tomorrow after everyone leaves. I'll show you. The next day, once the others had gone, Ethan and I returned to the lake with the plastic chair. My heart pounded as I sat down. He slapped the cloth against the chair, and when he touched my shoulder, the jolt was immediate. The world shifted again. This time, the spectral figures were clearer. Dozens of them dotted the shoreline. Some were wailing silently, mouths open in expressions of agony. Others trudged along, heads bowed. One woman in a tattered dress wept as she clutched something invisible to her chest. I tried to call out to them, but they didn't react. They can't hear us, Ethan said. They're trapped here, people who drown in the lake. A chill ran down my spine. How do you know this? My grandfather told me stories, said the lake holds memories of those who've died in it. The vision faded and we were left standing by the tranquil waters. An uneasy silence settled between us. That evening, back at my grandparents' house, I was unusually quiet. My grandmother noticed. Her solution was feeding me more chicken soup. I lay in bed, the images of the spirits replaying in my mind. Sleep eluded me. Just as I began to drift off, a soft tapping at my window startled me. I sat up, heart racing. Ethan's face peered through the glass. We need to go back, 
he whispered when I opened the window. Now, it's the middle of the night. I think we can learn more. Please. Against my better judgment, I agreed. We slipped away into the cool night, the moon casting an ethereal glow over everything. At the lake's edge, we set up the chair once more. The stillness was unsettling. You go first. I sat down, and he repeated the ritual. As the jolt coursed through me, the surroundings transformed. The spirits were back, but this time, they were different. Their faces were sharper, their eyes glowing faintly, and they were all looking directly at us. Ethan, I whispered, fear creeping into my voice. They see us. He swallowed hard. We should leave. Before we could move, the spirits began to advance. They moved unnaturally, gliding over the ground without moving their legs. A low murmur filled the air, like a distant lament carried on the wind. Run! We bolted along the shoreline, the spirits in pursuit. The once familiar path became treacherous all of a sudden. I stumbled over rocks and roots, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The wailing grew louder, pressing in from all sides. I glanced back and saw one of the spirit's mere feet behind me, its hand outstretched. Its eyes were hollow, darkness swirling within. Panic surged, propelling me forward. Over here! Ethan called, veering towards a small footbridge that spanned a narrow stream feeding into the lake. We dashed across, and as we reached the other side, the spirits halted abruptly at the water's edge, unable to follow. We collapsed onto the grass, chest heaving. The spirit stood silently before slowly receding back toward the lake, eventually fading into the night. I am not doing that again. Ethan nodded solemnly. We parted ways, each sneaking back into our homes. The next morning, neither of us spoke of what happened. The rest of my stay passed uneventfully, but an unspoken understanding lingered between us. Years later, I still think about that summer. The images remain vivid, and I can't help but feel a twinge of guilt, as if our curiosity disturbed the souls at peace. I've never returned to that lake, but sometimes, in the quiet moments before sleep, I hear the faint echo of their silent wails. <laughs>